Good evening. My name is actually Jen. We have quorum, right? Yes, we have quorum. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rolando Bonilla, and I am the chair of the San Jose Planning Commission. Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting. This meeting is being held via Zoom conference call due to the COVID-19 crisis. Members of the public may participate by following the instructions listed on the agenda. You may also view and listen to the meeting on live stream, cable TV, Granicus, and YouTube. Following roll call during summary of hearing procedure, we will review how the public may provide comment during today's session. And I was informed that Commissioner Garcia will be joining us about 10 minutes late. So, Bodina here. Casey? Here. Caballero? Here. Cantrell? Here. Garcia is running late. Lord and Wah. Lord and Wah. All right, Montañez. Here. Oliverio. Here. Ornelas Wise. Here. Torrance. Here. And Young. Here. Let the record reflect that at this moment, Commissioners Lord and Wah and Garcia are not present. I'm Summary here. of hearing. Oh, you are perfect. Thank you so much, Commissioner Lord Noir. Summary of hearing procedures. The procedure for this hearing is as follows. After the staff report, applicants and appellants may make a five minute presentation. City staff will call out names of the public who identify the items they want to speak on. You may identify yourself by the raise hand feature on Zoom, click star nine on your phone, or you may call 408. 535-3505 or email planning support staff at sanjosaca.gov and identify your name, phone number, and what items you'd like to speak on. As your name is called, city staff will unmute you to speak. After we confirm your audio is working, your allotted time will begin. Each speaker will have two minutes. Speakers using a translator will have four minutes. After the public testimony, the applicant and appellant may make closing remarks for an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. Response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. Staff will unmute the speaker to respond to the commissioner. The public hearing will then be closed and the planning commission will take action on the item. The planning commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions and discuss the item. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. The Planning Commission's actions on rezonings, prezonings, general plan amendments, and code amendments is only advisory to the council, city council. The city council will hold public hearings on these items. Section 20.120.400 of the municipal code provides the procedures for legal protests to the city council on rezonings and prezoning. The Planning Commission's action on conditional use permits is appealable to the city council in accordance with section 20.100.220 of the municipal code. And with that, we will now call to order and orders of the day. Commissioner Oliveira, I see your hand is raised. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to share something with the uh, commissioners and staff. Our planning commission agenda, it's comprised of a series of documents and each and every one of those documents are uh, not accessible. And what I mean is that members of our community fall under different disability categories. And based on how the documents are, they're unable to use assistive technology to navigate and process the documents. So I just wanted to bring that up and uh, let, let that be known. Uh, thank you for that, Commissioner Olverio. And, and uh, that's a great, it's great feedback. Um, Staff, mm -hmm. is there any way that we may be able to, to address that perhaps at a future meeting just or, or whatever the appropriate mechanism is? We, we absolutely do not want to leave anyone outside of the process. Can, is there any, anyone can answer question, question? Is it the items tonight or is this sort of a more general issue that you're experiencing? Um, I, I just looked at all the documents associated to the agenda, the agenda itself, the minutes and all the staff reports and each of them fail on accessibility checks. And, and so that's, that's why I'm bringing it up. Okay, well, well, we'll have to look into that. Thanks. All right, and uh, Michelle Oliverio, if you can 
raise the issue uh, until it gets resolved, that would be appreciated. I think that's a very good point to bring up to the uh, commission tonight. Thank you. Item two, public comment. Public comment to the Planning Commission on non-agendized items. Please use the raise hand feature in Zoom or click star nine to raise a hand to speak. Each member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes. The commission cannot take any formal action without the item being properly noticed and placed on an agenda. In response to the public comment, the Planning Commission is limited to the following options, responding to statements made or questions posed by members of the public or requesting staff to report back on a matter at a subsequent meeting or directing staff to place the item on a future agenda. Staff, do we have any speakers for public comment for items not on the Planning Commission agenda tonight? We do have one hand raised. Uh, Todd, is this for an item not listed on the agenda? Yes. Okay, you have two minutes to speak. I, I just always bring up at the beginning of these meetings that if it was a public forum meeting, I would be able to see who the attendees were and how many attendees there are. And I know a Zoom meeting can be set up that way, but for some reason, it's not. And I find that to be a form of censorship. So maybe that's something that you guys can look into changing in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that. Is there anyone else for public comment? That concludes our hands raised. All right, we'll now move on to item four, deferrals and removal from calendar staff. It does not appear that we have any items to defer today. Is that accurate? Yes. All right, thank you. We'll now move to the consent calendar. Are there any public speakers on items currently on the consent calendar? Seeing none, commissioners. Motion to approve can, the consent calendar. Actually, um, can we make a motion, two separate motions? Can we move um, items 4A, C, and D, and then vote on D separately because I was not at the meeting on January 26th? Sure, or, or you can abstain. Um, uh, yeah, Vera, how do you, how do you, wanna, how do you want me to cut this up tonight? Vera. I apologize, let me okay. unmute here. I was right. I was having some trouble unmuting and I was on a message with somebody. Um, what was the question again? Commissioner Montañez, would you mind sharing with uh, Vera? Sure, um, so uh, if we can move items uh, for A, C, and D, um, and then vote separately on B because I wasn't here for the January 26th meeting. Oh, absolutely, you can do that, yes. Perfect. Okay. All right, thank you for that, Commissioner Montaigne. So then with that, do we have a motion to approve items A, C, and D? Motion to approve. Second. Florence, Florence with the motion, Caballero with the second. So let's go ahead and take a roll call vote. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell? Yes. Garcia, is he here yet? No, okay. Uh, Lord and Watt? Yes. The yes? Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Ornelas Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. And Young? Yes. The motion passes. And now with that, can I get a motion and a second for 4B? Motion to approve uh, 4B of the consent calendar. Second. Second. Oh, Tor go Torrance. ahead. Justin got there first. <laughs> Torrance with the motion. Florida Noir with the second. All right. We'll do a roll call vote. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell? Yes, and actually, I need to change. Um, a, I thought we were doing B, C, D. We didn't do. We did A first, then, correct? Correct. Yeah, we did A, C, okay. and D. I need to first. abstain from A. I was not at that meeting. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank and you. It, Sorry. And, but you were here for 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 yes. four B. Perfect. Okay. Yes, on B. Yes. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Correct. Perfect. Uh, Garcia still running late. Lord Noir. Yes. One thing, yes. 
Abstain. Abstain. That's right. Oliverio? Here. Ornelas Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. And Young? Yes. Motion passes with Montañez abstaining and Garcia uh, not present. All right. All right. We will now go to item five, public hearing. I'm feeling really smart tonight. I've got these really new glasses here, so bear with me, all right? <laughs> item five, staff presentation, please. <laughs> all right, um, this is Alex Hughes with staff. Uh, can I share screen? Yes, please do. Thank you. Actually, can I interrupt for a second? I just want to confirm um, who uh, Commissioner, I think Cantrell, Cantrell, you said you were abstaining from item 4B. Is that correct? No, oh, 4A. Oh, so wait. OK, I'm a little confused now. <laughs> A was for the 12th, correct? So that's 4 A was done with 4A, 4C, and 4 D, and you're abstaining from those three. Correct. Was okay. right. And oh, and um, on Montanez, Commissioner Montanez was just abstaining on four B. Correct. And no one else. She she was nodding. <laughs> oh, okay. Got it. All right. I think I got it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Michael. Let's see. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Alexander Hughes, and I'm the project manager for the zoning update to our cannabis, cannabis ordinance. Uh, joining me today is Wendy Salazi, division manager from the police department's division of cannabis regulation along with Sergeant Wolsey, also with the Division of Cannabis Regulation, which is the lead agency for this work. Also with me today is Michelle McGurk with the City Manager's Office and Martina Davis, Supervising Planner. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, we'll start with a little bit of background so you can understand our current regulatory framework and how we got to where we are today. Before the city had a regulatory program for cannabis, over 100 medical cannabis facilities or collectives existed in the city. The city's cannabis regulatory program began in July of 2014, allowing businesses that were open at the time to file for registration under the new regulations that defined where a medical cannabis collective could go, what the operational and regulatory requirements were, and the total limit on the number of businesses a single registrant could operate. At that time, the city required vertical integration where each collective had to conduct cultivation, processing, manufacturing, and dispensing from one site only. As such, the zoning standards for cannabis uses adopted in 2014 limited them to industrial areas and included other criteria such as distance to sensitive uses. Businesses were given a time frame to come into compliance and a, a total of 16 cannabis collectives completed the registration before the program closed. Originally, these businesses were limited to medical cannabis. When California passed Proposition 64 in 2016 to allow the recreational use of cannabis, Council approved the 16 collectives to engage in non-medical cannabis activities. In 2017, all 16 of San Jose's cannabis dispensaries shifted to recreational cannabis. In 2019, the city updated the regulatory program to allow new manufacturing, testing, and distribution facilities. These are the 16 registered cannabis dispensaries that got through the registration process and met all zoning requirements. Now, I'm gonna talk you through the application process to open a cannabis business. This is the existing process and we are not recommending any changes. An applicant for a new or relocated cannabis business location must begin their process by filing an application with the San Jose Police Department's Division of Cannabis Regulation. Applicants undergo fingerprinting, background checks, and provide several types of documentation 
that demonstrate how they will meet the standards for items such as security systems, where the required security guard will be located, how customer identification will be conducted, among many other things. Applicants also need to apply and receive a zoning code verification certificate from planning. Proposed locations must pass a site inspection by the Division of Canvas Regulation and must apply for a state license after receiving a notice of completed registration. Both a state license and a notice of completed registration are required before a business can operate at any location in San Jose. Planning staff review new or relocated cannabis business proposals as part of the application process with the zoning code verification certificate. We verify that they are in the correct zoning district and proposed locations are meeting all siting requirements, which include distance from sensitive uses and whether the proposed site is within an exclusion area, among other aspects we'll go into more detail later. After a site visit, for an on-the-ground look of the surrounding businesses to ensure we haven't missed any uses that could prohibit a cannabis business, we provide a zoning verification certificate that says whether all requirements are or are not met. If they do not meet all requirements, they could reapply for another certificate at another location, but otherwise the application process would end there for planning. This is the only step by, the plan by planning in the application process. There's no public hearing or permit for a cannabis use. For example, there's no conditional use permit requirement, and we're not proposing to change this because the operation and security conditions uh, under Title VI are very robust and address many of the concerns that a conditional use permit do. Restricting cannabis uses to industrial zoning districts combined with the distance requirements to sensitive uses and the exclusion areas limit the number of available sites for our cannabis industry. If you look at where these dispensaries are located, it's clear that these limiting factors create a concentration of these businesses in two council districts, districts three and seven. These distinct or these districts have between them roughly 85% of all sites that meet the current zoning ordinance standards and are home to 13 out of the 16 cannabis businesses. On March 5th, 2019, City Council prioritized two cannabis-related items that bring us here today, which were one, review of the cannabis land use regulatory provisions, which includes assessing allowing cannabis uses in commercial areas, allowing a second retail location for existing businesses, and removing blackout or exclusion areas, and two, creating and implementing the Cannabis Equity Applicant Program. What we are presenting to the Commission today is the changes to the zoning ordinance resulting from this Council direction. It's important to note that the zoning ordinance changes discussed are only part of the overall process uh, moving forward to city council. The zoning ordinance only addresses where businesses are allowed to locate and sets forth the process for obtaining a zoning verification certificate. But outside of the zoning ordinance, Title VI of the Municipal Code, along with the city manager regulations dictate who can apply for a cannabis business, how many cannabis businesses can exist in the city, and the regulation process for a cannabis business, or registration process, excuse me. We want to be clear that the changes to who can register and how many businesses can exist within the city are not addressed in the zoning ordinance, so are not under the purview of the Planning Commission. But however, when we're, you're considering where businesses may be able to locate in the future, it is helpful to know how many we are talking about. The police department are recommending to allow each of the 16 existing businesses to open a second location in the commercial areas allowed by this proposed zoning ordinance update and to keep their existing industrial location open. Title VI also creates the Cannabis Equity Program and the police department is proposing to open up registration for up to 10 new equity applicants. These equity registrations would be open to delivery only or dispensary uses with a limit of no more than five registrations for a dispensary use. In total, this could create up to 21 new dispensaries and up to a total of 42 cannabis businesses, which does include the 16 we have now. We began our outreach back in 2019, shortly after we received the council direction to begin this work. This whole process has been a team effort between the police department, the city manager's office, and our own planning department. You can see here some of the outreach strategies we used. 
to try to reach as many people as possible. We coordinated with council offices and the Office of Racial Equity. We also notified community stakeholders like neighborhood associations. As part of our survey, we collected an email list of approximately 200 respondents that we have been using to notify people of our progress. We also use social media such as Nextdoor, Twitter, and Facebook, and developed a dedicated website for this work where we've posted updates and information as we have it. Wherever possible, we translated materials into simplified Chinese, Spanish, and Vietnamese. With regards to the industry outreach, we've had good communication with the 16 existing businesses and their representatives. For example, we had a kickoff industry meeting attended by about 30 owners representing the 16 registered businesses. We've taken feedback from them to shape our recommendation. For example, our original recommendation was to allow the existing businesses to relocate their existing storefront into one of the proposed new commercial locations, but we heard a concern and overall frustration about them losing their investment that they had made in their current industrial locations. So the recommendation has shifted to allow them to keep their current retail location open in addition to allowing a new location. The largest quantity of feedback we got from the general public, though, was through our online survey, which was published in March through April of 2021. The survey was offered in four languages and had approximately 950 respondents across the languages offered. I'll go into more detail on the survey shortly. We followed the survey up with a virtual community meeting. We advertised this meeting broadly, including inviting the 200 people who asked for follow-up through the survey. In the end, we had 12 attendees at the meeting, most of whom were from the cannabis industry. One of the 200 people emailed was unable to make the meeting, but was given the recording and accompanying materials uh, through email correspondence. The majority of the conversation in this meeting centered on the equity program and other items that were not related to land use, such as the city's cannabis tax structure. One attendee, a cannabis business owner, wanted to see an event license or a social consumption aspect for cannabis. And another attendee, a community member, pointed out that the proposed 1,000-foot distance requirement between dispensaries for downtown could result in a, one business precluding another, which we've addressed in our current proposal. As part of the review process, our team presented land use and regulatory options to the Community and Economic Development Council Committee, or CED Committee for short, on January 28th and April 26th of 2021. The CED committee is a public meeting, so members of the public and the industry were able to provide input directly to the committee. The ordinance presented today reflects both the CED and community feedback to date. The other major piece of the outreach was an informational video that we posted on our website. We also posted a transcript of the video in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and simplified Chinese. The video covers the proposed changes presented here today and was distributed using the methods described previously. To date, approximately a dozen questions and comments about the video were received and includes similar concerns seen by other respondents in the surveys that I will discuss in a moment. Some of the um, e emails expressed a, a mixture of interest in applying for the equity applicant program or excitement about seeing the program allow cannabis in commercial areas or worries about possible litter or trash around these areas. Staff has been available to respond to questions and comments throughout the processes described here. The cannabis survey had approximately 950 responses. When asked if we should increase the number of dispensaries, 52% said no, and 46% said yes. In total, we had 454 respondents provide a whopping 1,700 written comments in the survey, and we reviewed and analyzed these comments, which were approximately half supportive and half opposed. In summary, the themes from these comments are as follows, in, in general order of frequency, with the most frequent first. These were that cannabis dispensaries should be treated the same as alcohol sales, which includes being allowed anywhere alcohol sales are allowed. That cannabis dispensaries should be kept away from anywhere children and teenagers congregate, including residential areas, with an overall concern about access to children. Support for cannabis dispensaries in convenient and walkable areas where people shop, general opposition to cannabis that the city should not facilitate or support it unless it's strictly for medical purposes, general support of deregulation of cannabis and treating cannabis like any other business, concerns that cannabis dispensaries will attract crime and or will negatively impact neighboring businesses. Cannabis dispensaries are acceptable in commercial areas as long as they are inconspicuous 
and concerns about public consumption of cannabis near dispensaries. After conducting community outreach and receiving direction from the CED committee, we have drafted this proposed amendment, which includes changes in three key areas of the zoning ordinance. We are proposing to update the use tables in several chapters of the zoning code, the specific use regulations chapter, and the administration permits chapter, specifically the section on the zoning code verification certificate. These amendments would allow delivery only as a use in the industrial zoning districts, allow cannabis retail or dispensaries in commercial areas, and exclude them from industrial ones, change distance requirements and alter exclusion areas, remove the downtown ground floor restriction, and allow a zoning code verification certificate to expire or prevent another cannabis business from locating near another such certificate. So let's take a closer look at what these changes are in the zoning districts. Currently, the uh, zoning ordinance does not support cannabis uses outside of industrial zoning districts. And it also does not allow delivery only uses in any zoning district. We are proposing to amend our zoning code to allow dispensaries in commercial zoning districts and are proposing to remove them from the industrial zoning districts. We are also proposing to allow delivery only uses in industrial zones. The zoning districts we are looking to make these changes to are listed on this slide. The zoning districts where retail, where retail storefronts would be allowed are zoning districts where commercial retail activities are permitted. You can see there are some seemingly residential zoning districts on there, such as transit residential, but those districts actually allow mixed use or standalone commercial development, so that's why they're included. The new delivery only use is proposed to be allowed in the industrial zoning districts where other non-retail cannabis businesses are allowed. Since these delivery only businesses do not have a public interface and could involve a lot of vehicle trips to and from the site, these are better suited to industrial areas where other warehouse and delivery type businesses exist. The bulk of our ordinance changes take place in the specific use regulations of Title 20 because this is where distance requirements for cannabis uses are located. The sections we are making changes to are parts 9.75 and parts 9.76. 9.75 outlines regulations for collectives, cultivation, and both medical and non-medical cannabis businesses. This section defines the exclusion or blackout areas and has the most restrictive set of distance criteria from sensitive uses. I'll refer to this section as the dispensary section moving forward. Part 9.76 outlines regulations for manufacturing, distribution, and testing of cannabis. There's no exclusion or blackout area for these uses, and the distance criteria from sensitive uses are less than those set in the dispensary section because these businesses don't engage with the public. We are not recommending changes to distances for the section, and I'll refer to this section as the industrial section moving forward. Currently, the dispensary section includes cultivation, which isn't open to the public. We conclude it would be better to move this to the industrial section with other similar industrial uses. By doing this, the only thing the dispensary section would cover is medical and non-medical cannabis dispensaries. Moving cultivation to the industrial section would reduce the distance requirements from sensitive uses with the exception of distances to residential, which would remain the same under the current proposal. We're also adding delivery only to the industrial section because it is functionally more similar to the other non-storefront cannabis uses than it is to a storefront or dispensary. Currently, the dispensary section restricts uses from enterprise areas, which are the North San Jose Development Policy Boundary, the International Business Park Boundary, and the Edenville Area Development Policy Boundary, and prevents cannabis uses from locating on the ground floor in the downtown area. The ordinance would remove the enterprise exclusion areas and the downtown ground floor restriction but it would also add a new exclusion criteria called the police beat exclusion, which would prevent a dispensary from locating in areas that have a 20% higher than citywide average crime rate in a police beat as defined by the San Jose Police Department. This is the same criteria we use when evaluating applications for off sale of alcohol. However, a key difference is that alcohol sales are allowed within these police beats if the planning commission or council makes special findings at approval but a cannabis use would not be allowed at all under this exclusion criteria. This map shows the current exclusion areas, which are the North San Jose International Business Park and Edenvale policy boundaries. 
This map shows the proposed police speed exclusion area. When we looked at data for these police speeds, we realized that while they can change from year to year, large parts of downtown are almost always included. The CED committee gave direction that they want these new regulations to allow dispensaries to locate downtown. So we are not proposing to apply the police speed exclusion criteria to this area. Now let's talk about the distance criteria to sensitive uses under the dispensary section. Currently dispensaries are prohibited from opening within a thousand feet of a public or private preschool, elementary or secondary school, child daycare center, community or recreation center, park or library, 500 feet of a substance abuse rehabilitation center or emergency residential shelter, 150 feet of a religious assembly, adult daycare center or any residential use, or within 50 feet of another dispensary. The state also has mandatory distance requirements of 600 feet from schools, daycare centers and youth centers. You can see our distance requirements are currently more stringent. So when we analyze these existing distances, we identified that if we allowed dispensaries and commercial zoning districts, but kept these distances unchanged, we had only about 200 parcels throughout the city that would be potentially eligible for a cannabis dispensary. That's just based on the zoning criteria alone and the likelihood of these parcels being available for lease or them even wanting to lease to a cannabis business would likely further decrease this number. When we presented this to the CED committee last year, they directed us to re-examine these distances and offer alternatives that allow more sites. I know this table can be a lot to take in, so let's break it down. We got clear direction from council and CED to increase the total number of sites dispensaries could locate at. And one of the first things you'll notice is that the downtown and urban village areas are considered separately. These areas have, or are planned to have a dense mix of commercial and residential uses. And the reality is that the compact nature of these areas put most locations within them next to a sensitive use, particularly when it comes to residential distance requirements. Distances from schools in all areas are kept the same at 1,000 feet because of concerns both by staff and the public around youth access and exposure. We are adding the state criteria of youth center into the municipal code as a sensitive use and distances from daycare or youth centers would be a thousand feet for areas outside of downtown or 600 feet within downtown. Youth centers are defined by the state as any public or private facility that is primarily used to host recreational or social activities for minors. Examples of a youth center would be a boys and girls club or an amusement arcade. We didn't originally include youth centers because we thought the other distance criteria we had would cover those, but we realized that there's a bit of a gap and we want to better align our regulations with the state to ensure that we don't sign off on a location that can't get state approval. We are maintaining the distance requirements for community or recreation centers, parks or libraries at a thousand feet for the city at large and removing this distance requirement for dispensaries locating within the downtown or urban village areas. Distances from rehab or emergency residential shelters would be removed for the downtown area, but kept out of 500 feet outside of the downtown area. To control for concentration of cannabis dispensaries, the distance from a dispensary for the downtown or urban village area would be increased to 500 feet and further increased to 1,000 feet for the rest of the city from the existing 50 feet. We've heard from industry representatives a, a desire to lower this distance between dispensaries to make sites more potentially available. Uh, while we agree that lowering this number would make more sites available, we've also heard a lot of concern around concentration of these businesses near each other by the public. Uh, keep in mind, the lower the standard goes, the more opportunities there would be for the businesses to concentrate around each other. We feel that the 1,000 foot or 500 foot distance strikes a good balance and was endorsed by the CED committee. Lastly, we are also removing religious assembly and adult daycare centers uh, use requirements and uh, are not requiring a distance from residential uses for locations in the downtown or urban village areas. For areas outside of downtown or urban villages, the way distance from residential would be measured changes from parcel to parcel or as the crow flies to a path of travel measurement. 
The dispensary section currently measures distance to residential using a parcel boundary to parcel boundary method, which is commonly referred to as, as the crow flies. The ordinance as proposed would use a path of travel distance measurement, which is defined as a continuous unobstructed way of pedestrian passage by means of which the use may be approached, entered and exited where open to the public. This measurement, measurement type considers intervening structures and more accurately represents the reality of our built cityscape. And the next few slides illustrate this difference. The example shown here is located at 991 Saratoga Avenue. It's a small commercial building near the intersection of Saratoga and Williams. And I wanna make sure that everyone knows this is just an example. There is no actual proposal here. You can see here that a parcel to parcel measurement from the residential use shown in yellow to the green example parcel totals 108 feet and would not qualify under the existing 150 foot requirement. However, there are two intervening fences and landscaping between the residential properties and the example space, which means there's no real opportunity for interfacing with the location in a direct path using that as the crow fly measurement. You can see in this example how the hard barriers like fences or sound walls prevent feasible access to the location. When using a path of travel measurement, however, travel from the nearby residential use to the example locations, public access is a, a much farther distance. It approximates 350 feet compared to the 108 in the parcel to parcel or as the crow fly measurement. This brings us to the zoning code verification certificate changes. I wanna reiterate here that this is the only step by planning in the application process. There's no public hearing or permit. For example, there's no conditional use requirement and we're not proposing to change this because the kinds of things that we would address in a conditional use permit are addressed in the robust, robust regulations of Title VI. At present, these certificates do not expire and capture a snapshot in time based on what other uses are in operation in the vicinity at the time of issuing the certificate. This causes two problems. An applicant could apply and receive a certificate with no intention to effectuate a cannabis use at a location, but instead sit on the certification indefinitely and effectively keep those initial standards despite how the uses around it might change. Or two dispensaries could possibly obtain certificates within a prohibited distance of one another because at the time of certification, neither business is open yet. So they aren't considered when evaluating the distance requirements to issue the certificate. For these reasons, we are proposing to add a provision that the certificate will expire if a cannabis business does not commence operations at the location within 24 months of the date the certificate is issued. We are also proposing to specify in the ordinance that a certificate cannot be issued where another valid certificate for a cannabis business exists within either 500 feet within a downtown or urban village area or 1,000 feet when outside of these areas, whether or not the other cannabis business has opened yet. In total, the amendments proposed roughly create 1,300 delivery only locations and 1,400 retail or dispensary locations within San Jose. What this doesn't show is the distance from another dispensary, which controls for concentration and could exclude others. And as a reminder, we are only recommending a maximum of 21 new dispensaries. Here's a close up of some of our urban villages that shows the eligible sites. Within downtown, there are approximately 500 parcels. Keep in mind that downtown is relatively small. So once one dispensary gets a certificate for a site, it's going to greatly reduce the remaining number of available sites due to the 500 foot distance requirement between dispensaries. As part of our requirements under CEQA, staff hired a consultant to prepare an initial study to analyze changes in the amendments discussed here because what this ordinance essentially does is allow retail sales of cannabis in areas where retail sales are allowed, we found no new environmental impacts would result from this ordinance change. The initial study and draft negative declaration was circulated for a period of 20 days and we received no public comments. In summation, the cannabis ordinance update would change the use tables to allow cannabis delivery only uses in industrial zoning districts and add this under part 9.76 or the industrial section. 
It would allow cannabis retail or dispensaries in commercial zoning districts and modify the distance requirements from sensitive uses for dispensaries and replace the old exclusion zones with a new one known as the police beat exclusion area. This update would also modify the zoning code verification certificate process by adding a check for other certificates in the vicinity and would add a 24 month expiration to the certificate. Combined, these changes allow an expansion of our local cannabis industry while including controls to ensure these businesses are not concentrated in close proximity and are not located near sensitive uses, particularly those where youth congregate. In conclusion, staff recommends the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council adopt a resolution approving the Cannabis Business Ordinance Update, Initial Study, and Negative Declaration adopt an ordinance amending Title 20 as posted on the agenda with the following modifications for consistency with state terminology. The first would be a change to non-medical cannabis dispensary, which would then become cannabis storefront retail. And the next change is Medical Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act and the Adult Use or of Marijuana Act would become the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. And that concludes staff's presentation. Alexander, thank you for that. Uh, I do want the record to reflect that Commissioner Garcia joined us at 6.56 p.m. And precisely because of that, uh, I'll let you have your drink of water, Alexander. Great job. Uh, can you uh, remind us of what agencies comprise the, I think you said, CDE committee? Sorry, can you say that again? I, I, can, I, can, I can answer that one. There you go. Uh, Martina Davis, Acting Division Manager. Good evening, everybody. So that is the City of San Jose's Community and Economic Development Committee. It is a subcommittee of our city council. So it is sat on by a number of members of our city council. Um, they analyze um, work again, having to do with community and economic development. Um, and it is a public Brown Act body. So it is a public hearing when they meet. Thank you for that. And just out of curiosity, is the police department a part of that committee or, or, or are they a separate conversation? So this entire project has been um, very, very much in, uh, done in conjunction with the, the police department. They don't typically staff or attend that committee because, you know, usually items aren't, don't pertain to them. Um, but we've really been a, a team between planning the city manager's office and the police department on this work just because our regulations, their regulations are so intertwined. Um, so they were there at every CED committee meeting. Um, that we discussed this at, and in fact, the, the police department's input really actually shaped um, a lot of this ordinance. It's, it's really been a teamwork, not a, not a planning project that police was just somewhat involved in. It's really been a team project. Thank you, Martina. I just wanted to make sure that my colleague had the full picture since he just came on board. All right, with that, I will now go to public comment. Jen, do we have any public comment? Yes, we do. Uh, Nathan Olsh, you have two minutes to speak. Good evening, Chair Bonilla and Planning Commission members. My name is Nathan Olsh, the Director of Policy and Operations at the San Jose Downtown Association, representing over 1,800 businesses and property owners, striving to increase the vitality of our beloved downtown. And we support the staff recommendation tonight. We believe San Jose, specifically uh, downtown, is poised for this program expansion as we see potential to activate underutilized storefronts, mitigate vacancies, and increase activity in our community. Moreover, as stated in the staff memo, total average crime rates were significantly less on blocks containing dispensaries. This is a very compelling statement to our members. We are very cognizant that an increase in dispensaries also means a need to hire more city staff, including police, which we also recommend. Lastly, it would make sense to also consider new safe social consumption policies for outdoor events, such as San Francisco's grasslands at the outside land festival, which touts a great experience for crowds to enjoy music. So why not start the year on a high note? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Yes, um, I'm concerned that uh, none of the analysis seem to uh, take into account who the customers, the new customers would be for these um, new uh, retail uh, outlets. Um, 
uh, I remember in previous um, uh, initiatives to start this in San Jose, um, there was a lot of comment commentary about, you know, Sunnyvale, Cupertino, and other cities not having dispensaries in effect, um, meaning that um, uh, residents beyond the boundaries of San Jose will be coming to San Jose to make these purchases. <clears throat> and it would be interesting to get commentary from uh, the, the group that's been working on this as to what they forecast in that regard, if they uh, anticipate any um, ill effect from that as well. Um, I, it's interesting, I, I missed uh, the opportunity to comment um, on the environmental impact, but uh, my recollection was originally the concept was seed to sale, meaning that the uh, product is grown here locally. And it, I find it hard to believe that there is no economic, or I'm sorry, no environmental impact from uh, the grow operations, which take a ton of, uh, of lighting. Um, so I, I would like I would like response from the city on that, please. Thank you. Next speaker. That concludes all of our hands raised at this time. Oh, actually, no, we have another hand raised. Uh, Sean Kelly Wright. Thank you, Chair uh, and Honorable uh, Planning Commissioner, Sean Kelly Rye, Silicon Valley Cannabis Alliance. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate that this was the City Council's number one priority in 2019. Uh, it is large in scope. Staff has done a tremendous job in outreach, as you've heard from the presentation by Alexander. There have been many public hearings. There have been online uh, outreach. There have been City Council committees uh, and even another City Council hearing on this issue before it was brought back. So it has been in the pipeline for some time and there's been a lot of outreach and a lot of input. Um, San Jose is actually behind the curve when it comes to zoning. Redwood City has, is only allowing cannabis and retail commercial zoning. Union City allowed cannabis uh, retail dispensaries at their super regional mall called Union Landing. Hayward has allowed it in the historic district downtown. San Francisco, Oakland, Chico, Fairfield, Belmont, San Bruno, San Mateo, uh, are all contemplating it or have approved zoning in uh, retail commercial zoning only, not industrial. Uh, San Jose also has the experience of having run a cannabis program extremely well over the last six years, almost going on seven. The DCR with Wendy and Sergeant Woolsey have done an exemplary job in working with the industry. And you don't hear about cannabis in the newspaper or anywhere else because Frankly, we don't have those problems other cities have because PD is so closely uh, intertwined with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, San Jose's industry was $89 million at the end of 2016. It's now estimated at 170 million. That's almost double. And it's the same amount of dispensaries in the same industrial areas with double the traffic and double the customer count and hence the need and so I'd ask that you move for approval of the staff recommendation. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Is there any more public comment? It looks like that concludes our public comments. All right. I will leave the public hearing open in the event that we do have questions, uh, subject matter experts. Uh, so having said that, I will now uh, leave it open to, to commissioner questions. Colleagues, do we have any questions? Commissioner Olivario, Commissioner uh, thank Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, so a couple questions. One, just to be clear, in the recommendation, you're still recommending no ground floor in the downtown. Is that correct? Uh, we would be removing that restriction. So it would, it would be it allowed. It would be allowed, yeah. Thank you. Wasn't clear. Pardon me for that. And then on the, um, on the equity applicants, is a requirement that you've been incarcerated for um, a drug crime or a, a cannabis crime when it was illegal, or has that criteria been set yet? Good evening, Commissioner Oliverio. The criteria, we have an existing cannabis, uh, Michelle McGurk from the city manager's office. Um, we have an existing cannabis equity pro, uh, ordinance that's on the books. We have been tasked with and have state grant funding and to do a cannabis equity assessment. That is going to council on February 15th. 
and it would update the eligibility requirements. Incarceration is not a requirement. Um, what we are proposing based on the equity assessment and the disproportional uh, rates of arrest or um, impacts from cannabis prohibition in different neighborhoods is we're, we're looking at a geographic approach where business owners would, um, would be located. So that's all posted for the council meeting of February 15th. Um, and of course is within the purview of the city council to make that decision rather than the planning commission. Thank you very much and hope you're doing well. Uh, and then I just wanted to state staff brought up the CEQA document that was published and uh, allowed for public comment. Um, but yet again, that document, that CEQA document, it has 11 accessibility errors. So that again means people of different disability categories, multiple disability categories would be unable to navigate and process this CEQA document. Thank you, Commissioner Oliverio. Uh, Commissioners Torrance, Lardinois, then Young. Torrance, Commissioner Torrance, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my question is this, this, I thought of this as we were hearing one of our uh, public speakers uh, made a point. So, so how do, dis do dispensaries make streets safer? Because that was one thing that was stated that I'm just curious about. Are there any statistics around that? And why, why would that be so? And then there was an additional comment made that said, yet we need to require additional police around dispensaries. So can maybe Martina clarify that or someone else from on the staff? Yeah, no, I'm happy, I'm happy to clarify um, because I definitely do not want to overstate what we were saying in our staff report with regard to the crime statistics. Um, so one thing we, we, you know, came up a lot, right, was a concern around do these attract crime? Um, and so we tried our best using the data we could get to, to see what we could find, you know, with, are there statistics showing either way. Um, so what we did is to, uh, because we hear frequently, you know, these are not very different from alcohol sales, right? Um, so we thought, let's look at uh, licensed off-sale establishments in close proximity for, to our dispensaries to see if there's a difference in rates of crime. Um, either at those businesses or in the vicinity. Um, for privacy reasons, we actually couldn't get uh, crime reports for the businesses themselves, but we were able to get analysis of the number of reported crimes on the block. So it was a comparison of the number of reported crimes on a block in 2021 containing a cannabis dispensary. And then within, I think we look for alcohol sale licenses within a, a couple thousand feet of those, it was close as we could get. Up. Yeah, okay, thanks, Alex. It was about a half a mile. Um, you know, we tried to find as close ones as we get. So it's kind of, you know, apples to apples as much as we could get. And we uh, got crime rates for those blocks that, that contained those. And we did find that the crime rates were actually lower on the blocks uh, containing a cannabis use. Now, does that mean that it's because of the cannabis use that the, the um, crime is lower? I mean, we definitely cannot say that. We can't say why the crime is lower. There could be lots of reasons. But we were really looking to see, you know, is there a discrepancy? Is there more crime? Is there, are we looking at a lot of crimes on these blocks? And we really did find that as close as we could get to that kind of comparison that we weren't seeing um, any increase. And in fact, yeah, just the numbers showed us less crimes on those blocks. So that's what those numbers were. Um, definitely don't want to present that as cannabis uses uh, reduce crime. That's, you know, we can't conclude that based on the data that we had, certainly. Um, but uh, we definitely also can't, you know, did not find that they increased it um, when making that comparison. And I know if, I don't, I'm not sure, Wendy, if you do want to step in, because I know, um, as mentioned, you know, the police department does regulate these very, very heavily. And so we do have a lot of information on uh, crimes reported on those cannabis businesses themselves. Um, so I, you know, Wendy, you don't have to add anything, but if you did have anything to add around that, um, just wanted to throw you the opportunity. No, I think you covered everything, Martina. So then the second part of my question, thank you, Martina and Wendy, um, was, so then does the ordinance require additional police to regulate, to regulate or to prevent crime? 
Wendy, I think that's a good question for you on how the regulatory program works, because it is essentially kind of a self-funded program um, that does pay for this robust regulation of those. So I think you'd be probably best to answer that one. Yeah, staffing costs are um, collected through the annual operating fee paid by the regulated businesses. So uh, if the council decides to um, expand the program and allow the second locations, the equity applicants, um, or the equity businesses, uh, then we would definitely have to evaluate our staffing plan and we would go back to full council on that. We aren't proposing anything at this time because we don't know how the city council will vote or if they'll make changes to our recommendations. So once we hear um, their feedback next Tuesday, then we'll move forward with going um, back to council with a staffing plan. Thank you very much. All right, Commissioner Lord and Juan and Commissioner Young. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm not, I understand if you don't have this information, I'm just curious. Um, this is not specifically a land use matter, but it is relevant in making this decision. Do we have some sense of the potential revenue increases to the city that would come with this policy change? Uh, Wendy Slazzi, Division of Cannabis Regulation Police again. Uh, we aren't um, predict or we aren't doing any kind of estimates on revenue. Again, it still depends on what council will determine um, how we proceed forward as to um, any kind of expansion of our program. Again, that will also go to full council uh, after uh, the recommendations are made. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Young. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, excellent uh, staff presentation, Jonathan. Thank you. That was really, really terrific. Um, I have a question for staff, which is, could you talk briefly about what an equity applicant is and why they're differentiated in the ordinance? Good evening, Commissioner Young, Michelle McGurk from the city manager's office. So an equity applicant is someone who um, in hopefully in their life experience um, had experienced disproportionate harm by cannabis prohibition and the war on drugs. So the cannabis industry is largely, um, you know, almost 90% white. It's, it's significantly male dominated industry. So many of the folks who were disproportionately harmed by arrests um, during the years of cannabis prohibition um, this equity programs are designed to give them an opportunity to um, become entrepreneurs, potentially, or become employees in this new industry. And so um, we, have a we have some defined criteria that we've set out um, to update in the ordinance for um, equity owners as well as for equity employees should the city decide to do a workforce development program down the road. So for equity owners, they would be required to be San Jose residents. They would um, uh, be required to live in either um, a Metropolitan Transportation Commission equity priority census tract that's rated high, higher or highest priority under MTC's Equity Priority Community Program, or in one of the city's former Strong Neighborhoods Initiative neighbors, neighborhoods. So kind of gives you a sense of the city that there's a lot of overlap between those two maps, but um, kind of gives you a sense of what portions of the city that would be. And then we have a checklist of things that would be required. Um, and, and there's a variety of factors. It could be that it, someone was, had a cannabis arrest or conviction in their past. It could be that they are uh, had a parent or sibling or child who was um, arrested um, or had a cannabis conviction in their past, and that could have, you know, impacted their family. Um, it could include. Um, I'm trying to think. Another factor that um, we are recommending adding to the ordinance is individuals who were survivors of um, domestic violence, sexual assault, um, or um, human trafficking related to 
um, working in the cannabis industry. And then for owners, one of the factors that's another or is somebody who's worked for two years uh, in the local cannabis industry in San Jose. So perhaps somebody who's worked, and that could, going back to 2009, so they could have worked legal in the legal industry, regulated industry, or um, in one of the former um, unregulated cannabis businesses. But those are the kind of the criteria that we're looking at. So hopefully that gives you a picture and, and what the goals are. Thank you. That, that was a great explanation. I, I'm very supportive of that idea, I think, to uh, allow folks that have been negatively impacted um, by the war on drugs to participate is terrific. And I think it's also really good that uh, it encourages local ownership of cannabis businesses rather than just the, the large, um, large, large businesses that might be nationwide. Thank you. I'm going to make a motion that we approve the staff recommendations on this item. You know, I will... Go ahead and second that motion, uh, but Commissioner Ornelas Wise is wanting to ask a question. I just saw that. So Commissioner Ornelas Wise, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have some questions and concerns. I know obviously um, there, it seemed from the staff report that the intent to bring this forward was because there was an over-concentration of, um, you know, this these cannabis distill, um, this, these places in District 7 and District 3. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if we, allow them to have a second location, but yet allow them to have, uh, I mean, that that they're still going to be highly concentrated in District 7, um, because then you'll allow them to exist in here, like delivery only, Am I, is that correct? Yeah, so the concern around concentration was primarily around the storefronts where there's a, a public visible component. Um, where there's not a visible component, honestly, they look like a warehouse. You would not know that it was a cannabis business um, other than maybe there's more security around, um, but uh, you wouldn't know, right? They, they blend in. So the real concern was the ones where, you know, it's a storefront, there's a sign, there's customers going in and out and they're all packed in one area. Um, so, so that's why we really were trying to address that concern around the storefronts and not so much the industrial um, type businesses, just because they're, they're pretty inconspicuous. Yeah, I think that one of the reasons why maybe there wasn't so much crime is because obviously in those specific areas, there's not so much density, there's larger lots, so there's less people, you know, in other areas, there is obviously higher density, higher crime. Um, that brings me to another point. One of the things that said that you wanted to eliminate these in high crime areas, which I think is fantastic, um, but you excluded the downtown core area. And I kind of wanted to know why, because high crime area is a high crime area. I think that there's, um, I mean, I don't know exactly what the map of downtown core looks like. Um, if there's areas of downtown that are not high crime, then maybe it's okay. But I, I, I just kind of want to understand why the downtown core, if it's high crime, it's high crime. Why was it excluded? Yeah, there's a, a couple reasons. Um, so, so just so you know, uh, the police, there's a couple police beats that cover most of downtown. And in most years, those are both in the over 20% crimes. Um, so, you know, downtown is a little bit of a different animal, um, you know, given the density, I think to your point, actually, when you've got a lot more people in one area, you're gonna see more crime. Um, and there was a very strong desire from council. And when we checked in with the CED committee as well, um, to allow these downtown, actually, our first, you know, we first thing we took to the CED committee was showing, hey, let's do this 20% crime. And the feedback we got was we really do want opportunities for these businesses downtown. So there was just no way to keep that 20% crime um, coverage on downtown and also allow businesses downtown. They're just kind of mutually exclusive. So the desire that um, we got, the recommendation, the direction we got from the committee was to go ahead and not have that um, downtown. And again, um, from a planning standpoint, you know, we, we were, were supportive of that in that again, you know, downtowns aren't like anywhere else. They are more compact. There are more people. It is normal to kind of treat downtown a little bit differently. Yeah, um, I recently, just like the other day, I took a walk downtown and obviously I saw a lot of vacancy there. So obviously we need to bring, you know, more businesses there. But there was, I saw in the staff report, some big concerns with, um, you know, the future of the families and youth, um, a lot of the youth and uh, trash. So, 
you know, of course, you know, I, I know it seems like you collaborate with the police department to really condition these projects and, and you only have so much power, policing power. I mean, of course, I would like to see, you know, more public outdoor trash cans, extra lighting, um, you know, maybe public art, you know, anything to beautify the landscape, um, you know, I mean, really to add, um, limit the hours of operation. And, you know, when I think of, of um, something like this going into a local shopping center, I, I kind of, or a commercial center, I think about when I was a teenager at Andrew Hill High School and walking down the street, like all the kids typically walk and then you pass the 7-Eleven and all those little stores there. So my concern is that, you know, that radius, right? I mean, I don't know, I, I know that you've increased the setback or, you know, the, the distance uh, from a school or sensitive area and I appreciate that. Um, of, of course, I, I just, you know, hope that you're a little bit more sensitive to to where those those pedestrian paths from a local school, a junior high, a high school, um, those are all the, obviously some concerns, right? Um, let me think of what other questions I had. Um, so just to be clear, uh, because you're gonna allow the change, um, the ones in the industrial area, mainly in District 7, will continue, but just delivery only. Is that correct? So they would be able to continue um, the retail business as legal non-conforming. Um, okay. So, yeah, and, and I'll share why why we, okay. we the collective, we landed on this recommendation after going to the CED committee a couple times on this. Um, and it's it's because, you know, those, those businesses based on our regulations have been put uh, forced, you know, put in those areas and have invested a lot into their businesses in those areas. Uh, many of them have done very, very expensive tenant improvements. Many of them have long-term leases, for example. Um, and so we heard very strongly that, you know, you're, if you make us close, you know, we, we're forfeiting all of this investment we made at your behest, essentially, <laughs> in these areas. Um, allow us to stay open so that, you know, we can kind of recoup those investments. Um, and that was the recommendation the committee meant, uh, went with. So, so that is the, the core reason as to why. Um, we have heard from some of the businesses, some may actually elect to remain open, some may not. I mean, you know, it's up to them, but uh, I have heard from a couple that they may not remain open in those areas, um, but they did want the ability to. Yeah. Um. Martina, I wanted to add, oh, shoot. Wendy, go ahead. If you wanted to say something, Wendy. Yeah, oh. you were unmuted. From Am I unmuted yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah. Sorry my, my screen is blinking. <laughs> but I just wanted to mention that around the locations, the cannabis locations, they are required to do um, trash pickup, uh, have exterior lighting, graffiti um, removal, um, can't have cannabis consumption, there's no loitering. So there are certain things that are put in as good neighbor requirements, just so you're aware. Yeah, I mean, obviously in the downtown area, you would definitely need some, um, you know, sidewalk steam cleaning projects or something to to clean those areas up. Um, let me think, I, I wrote a lot of notes. So let me just go through my notes here. I think uh, I think that's all the questions I had. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ornelas Wise. Uh, are there any other comments? Uh, if not, I can definitely explain why why I seconded Commissioner Young's uh, a motion. Go, going once, going twice. Okay. So the, the reason I seconded Commissioner Young's motion is I do have the unique benefit of being intimately involved with the subject matter for since since San Jose was the uh, the wild west on the subject matter and and we've gotten to the point where we are now and in my mind this is a very natural evolution to where we have to go because this is in many ways uh, crime fighting as well uh, I think when when you when you are, are create much more control around this market uh, I know in my district uh, it, it it takes it off of our streets. Uh, and puts it in a format where people have to actually go through 
literal uh, loops and hurdles by which to access this, everything from cameras to photo identification to extensive chronicling of who's coming in and who's coming out. And I think for me, perhaps the biggest reason that I am very comfortable with this, and again, I do have the benefit of being intimately involved in the subject matter from the very genesis of it in San Jose. And by you, we are a, not just a state model, but a national model in terms of how do you, how to, how to reg regulate uh, marijuana usage in the city uh, is the fact that the San Jose Police Department has been a very intimate and vocal partner. Uh, to me, that is the most important seal of approval here. It confirms what I've always seen this as. This is a way by which to uh, regulate something that, I'll be frank with you, uh, I still see levels of it in my district, not as much as before, but we still deal with it. So I think the fact that the San Jose Police Department uh, has been intimately involved, continues to be intimately involved, uh, is literally putting their name on this, to me, uh, is the ultimate sign that we are moving in a direction where we aren't just thinking of this from a land use policy standpoint, but that we're also thinking of this from a public safety standpoint. And look, I'm the father uh, of three small kids. Uh, and I think to your point, Commissioner Ornelas Twice, uh, you know, I want to make sure uh, that when my kids are walking around, uh, th that the environment is clean, that there is a, a level of protection uh, that is invested in these sites um, that uh, is important to me. Uh, and I know that even in my district, uh, one of the things I've been very clear about is we need to be tougher on crime. And uh, one of the reasons I say this is I still have to deal with a level of uh, sale of uh, illegal uh, narcotics, uh, not not marijuana, but heavier substances that, in my mind, uh, you know, we, we, we need to completely decimate the, the competitive market for, for folks doing these things illegally. So that is why I'm supportive of Commissioner Young's motion. That is why I made my second. I was about to call for a vote, but I did see that Commissioner Garcia had his hand up. So we will call for a vote after Commissioner Garcia's comments. Yeah, my apologies for having technical difficulties uh, today, but um, you know, I, I am concerned. Uh, I realize there's a motion on the floor and it's been seconded to, to, to approve this, but I am concerned about the, um, the disbursement of the centralized locations that we have today. Uh, today, being in industrial areas, they're not, uh, they're not in our residential neighborhoods. It's probably why crime is lower there. Um, but let's not forget that this is still against the law from a federal level, right? I have to believe that that's part of the reason that uh, in the enterprise zones that it's not allowed because from the federal level, it's still against the law to, you know, to consume, possess, or sell marijuana. Yes, it's, it's legal at the um, state level, However, you know, we, we do need to be aware of that before we start opening the gates to have these at the local shopping center next to the grocery stores. Um, my other concern is that due to the zoning change, the, the um, if, I, if I understood correctly, there will be no conditional um, use permit required, obviously, and, and so there will be no um, reason to have community input. And, and so these things will get approved, uh, dispensaries, retail establishments, whatever, will get approved without community being aware of it. It'll just be there. And and frankly, as a citizen of uh, a resident of, of San Jose, I wasn't even aware until a week ago that we were going to be deciding on, on this. I think it's it's partly for us to to, to way, but I think it's also for the citizens of the uh, city to weigh in their opinions. Uh, and, and then lastly, the, um, the distance requirement or the, or the distance going from as a crow fly, as the crow flies to the path, I think somebody said that it was about a half a mile, but it's actually less than a quarter mile, a uh, thousand feet. So if, if I use my reference points like Mount Pleasant High School to the East Valley YMCA, that's a thousand feet. Or City Hall to the San Jose State Martin Luther King Jr. Library is a thousand feet. So a thousand feet's a lot closer than we seem to realize. And I think this is a, 
a little premature to, to be voting uh, and, and changing zonings in, in the city uh, at this point in time. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. I was going to call for a vote, but I just saw that uh, Commissioner Oliveira. Commissioner Oliveira, then we will call for a vote. <laughs> Commissioner Oliveira. My apologies, Chair, I was oh. muted. I, I just wanted to comment on my comments on the inadequacy of the, of the EAR. Uh, they're not part of our packet. It was referenced in the report, and then I found it on the city website and found the errors there. I just want to point that out. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Oliverio. And yeah, and, oh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the concerns are valid, and it's precisely why we do need to have a framework. Um, because if we didn't have a framework, uh, we would be, be a very different different territory. All right, Commissioner Ornelas Wise, I see your hand is up. Oh well, yeah, uh, I, I did remember some stuff that I wanted to bring up. Uh, all right. and, public outreach was really important to me, and I, and I did also um, wanted to mimic what Commissioner Garcia said in, in regards to involving the community. Um, and, um, you know, I know that a lot of people got hit hard, a lot of mom and pop small businesses, and, and they didn't have all the money to, to do all this. And yet they, they did comply with whatever DH or, you know, whatever they had to do with the Department of Environmental Health. A lot of people obviously invest money to make, you know, on-site improvements. Um, so it, it's not just um, these type of businesses and then have to walk away or lose everything sometimes. And so, um, you know, not everybody wants to go to a store. And then, you know, if I'm just wondering how um, neighboring businesses are going to feel, even if one of those type of businesses goes next to them and how that's going to affect them, you know, because some people might then say, I'm not going to go to that store I typically go to because I don't like that business that went in next door, you know, um, so there, there will be an impact to neighboring businesses. And definitely the early public notification on this is like, crucial and critical. Um, when I worked for county planning, um, there was a time where um, I was working with a small restaurant owner on the east side of San Jose, a really small shopping center, I think off of McKee or something. And um, there was a vacancy next door to him. And, and, um, and there was this pop up um, dispensary that just popped up. And it, were, it got busted and it got closed down like within like five days. But the, the, the guy next door, um, he told me, he said, like in those three days, hundreds of people came and, and, you know, I think about like, did it have the parking, you know, uh, obviously, and then they closed it down, but he told me, I mean, he, he, he was right next door and he told me. And so um, in that specific neighborhood, I mean, that, that was used to be like a little bar and it had a lot of police activity. And, and so um, the neighbors were up in arms about it. So early public notification is critical. Um, you know, I mean, so you just got to think about a lot of this stuff. So um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. No, and I agree, Commissioner Ornelas Wise. I think that's why it is important to have these frameworks and the council will also get the chance to weigh in on the broader and the importance is that our comments are also being reflected on the record. So thank you for that. All right, Commissioner Garcia, your hand's still up or is that a new hand up? Uh, let me take it down. My apologies. All right, no worries. All right, with that, we will go ahead and go for a, we will go ahead and take the vote. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell? Uh, yes, with a bit of a heavy heart on it, but yes. <laughs> no, I understand. Garcia? No. Lardinois? Lardinois? Oh, said, sorry, I don't know if I came through. Yes. Yes, okay. Montañez? Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Ornelas Wise? No. Torrance? No. Young? Yes. Yes, all right. With that, the motion passes. With uh, Garcia, Ornelas Wise, and, and uh, Torrance voting no. I want to thank you all for weighing in and it is a very delicate subject. I do appreciate everyone weighing in uh, and uh, all of this goes up to the council who has a broad, broader discretion and policy and 
uh, our comments will be a part of the record and a part of that conversation as well. So thank you for, for that. All right, with that, we will now go to item six, open the general plan hearing 2022 cycle one. We'll now go to item seven, general plan consent calendar. Seems that there are no items for consent. Uh, is that still correct, staff? That is correct. All right, we'll now go to item eight, general plan public hearing. Staff presentation, the floor is yours. All right, give me that awkward second to share the right part of my screen. Appreciate that. All right, so uh, my name is Jennifer Piose. I am the current planning project manager for the North First Street Urban Village Plan. And I have a bit of a lengthy presentation and I'll try to help uh, guide you through the multiple documents that we're gonna be talking about that are part of this approval. But I first wanna say a thank you to the former planning project manager, Tracy Tam, who brought this project almost up to hearing before she parted ways with the city. Um, she did amazing work with the community for three years um, while we were putting together and doing the outreach for this plan. So I wanted to say that before we continued. So item 8A is the North First Street Local Transit Village. We have five file numbers before you. So GP21016 is for changing general plan designations for properties that will remain within the village boundary, as well as changes to the original village boundary that was proposed in the adoption of the general plan in 2011. GP21017 is the changing of general plan designations for properties that are outside of the urban village. Uh, PP21-014 is for municipal code changes to section 20.85, which is the specific height regulations. North First Street falls under those currently the village area. And so we're making modifications to that. We'll discuss those a little bit later. C21041 is for rezonings for properties that are in the urban village boundary and will remain in the urban village boundary to align with their general plan designations. And lastly, C21042 is rezonings of properties that are going to be outside of the village boundary to align with their proposed general plan designations. So when the Envision 2040 general plan was adopted by the city council in 2011, one of our major strategies, number five, was for urban villages. The major strategies identify where the city will grow and in what time frame of this general plan through the year 2040. There are currently today 56 urban villages, one of which is this North First Street local transit village. If approved, the North First Street local transit village will be the city council adopted policy document with the goal to shape private development within the village boundary. As allowed by the general plan, the North First Street Local Transit Village Plan proposes land use, a land use diagram that will allow for up to 250 and 20 new jobs, which is about 750,000 square feet of new employment uses and up to 1,678 residential units. And I do wanna note that 333 units have already been entitled of that number. So we have about 1,345 residential units left um, for this planning area. With the exception of some affordable housing projects that comply with certain local or state laws, residential and commercial projects will have to, and employment projects will have to comply with the city approved um, urban village plan, any of the objective standards and, and guidelines and whatnot that will be contained therein. Uh, the village plan changes the general plan land use designations to allow for residential uses, which are not currently allowed except on sites that already have residential designations and adopts additional standards. So the plan includes goals, standards, guidelines, and action items to guide new development and private and public investment to achieve the vision of the village consistent with the general plan's major strategy. Through the land use diagram and supporting policies, the plan guides where commercial and residential uses can be built. And we'll be looking at that land use diagram shortly. 
Supporting the land use diagram are rules around building heights, densities, and floor area ratios, which all relate to those assigned land use designations. As part of the village planning process, the village boundary was adjusted to remove about 78 of the original 132 acres, remaining leaving about 56 acres um, for the village site. This is based upon community feedback, and we incorporated the likelihood for development repotential, as well as the preservation of historic properties, as there are many historic resources and potential historic resources within this village. Just a little overview of the timeline. This project was funded by a Caltrans grant back in 2017, and the city was able to hire a consultant to help with the work in 2018. We worked on existing research for existing conditions through 2018 and hosted our first workshop in 2019. And during 2019, between 2019 and 2020, there were delays because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we anticipate now that we're up and running again to have this before the city council in March. So community engagement, I wanna talk about that briefly. So over the course of the project, staff hosted three workshop series. We also did an online survey. We hosted virtual office hours where anyone could drop in and ask us questions. And we also hosted community leader meetings where we invited folks from the neighborhood associations around the village to provide feedback. The first workshop focused on the assets and opportunities around the village area. The second workshop, participants were asked to establish character areas for three different segments of the village to be able to help guide the land uses. And the third workshop, staff presented the draft village plan and in invited the participants to join virtual breakout rooms since it was during the pandemic shelter in place. We did this virtually where they can provide feedback in interactive format on the village plan. From these community meetings, online surveys, feedback emails, the public had many concerns, many of which are summarized on this slide. Height and neighborhood, neighborhood compatibility were big items, the desire for more gathering spaces, uh, pedestrian lighting, larger sidewalks and greenery around streets, uh, per, having protection from displacement specifically for housing, um, the retention of small businesses, also a displacement concern, issues with parking availability as development comes in, impacts to schools, and then not enough police to address illegal activities like loitering and drug use. So as part of the village planning document, we established a vision statement and three guiding principles with the community. So I'm not gonna read the entire thing. It was included in the packet. But the vision statement is around creating a, a vibrant, multicultural, well-connected community um, that supports local businesses. They wanna have amenities and provide housing opportunities. The first guiding principle built upon that was creating a vibrant business corridor and having great open spaces. The second guiding principle looked at creating a multicultural environment, preserving historic assets within and without the, within the village and those that were removed and encouraging affordable housing. And the last guiding principle was to establish a well-connected, safe and integrated multimodal transportation system. So as part of this village process, we can adjust the village boundary and it's happened with many of our plans. The original village boundary is demonstrated in the blue checkered outline. And then the proposed village boundary is the pink. We are using pink for this village plan. And so there's been a significant removal of some of the sites, many of which have historic properties or have existing um, entitlements that were approved recently or have um, in developments that meet um, their existing general plan designation or the goals of our um, general plan or their existing single family in large pockets that are not likely to be redeveloped and will be maintain their use. So they won't accommodate future growth. For the land use on the sites that are being retained in the urban village, we propose these modifications as are shown. Most of the existing sites within the village are right now neighborhood community commercial, which is typical for many of our remaining urban villages. 
meaning that only commercial uses can be approved in this village until such a time as the urban village plan is approved. Only exceptions being projects that go through our general plan policy IP 512, which is for 100% affordable projects or projects to go through our signature project process, which is for market rate or mixed income projects that provide projects that are above and beyond our normal standards and want to proceed before the urban village plan. We are proposing a total of five land use designations in this urban village. Some of these sites are going to require ground floor commercial, which is shown on this map with a red line, as you can see here along the street frontage. So a little bit about these land use designations, the five that'll be in this village. So we're retaining neighborhood community commercial on some of the sites. This is a medium to low intensity commercial designation where it's usually neighborhood um, serving commercial uses and small office. We're also proposing to have urban village commercial be integrated into the central portion of the urban village where more height is being proposed. This is for an intensive commercial activity. So there are larger buildings, bigger footprints and taller. So it can, you can envision uh, mid-rise office buildings. It could be healthcare facilities, hotel, uh, ground floor serving commercial, those sorts of things. What is not supported in this village plan are drive-through uses or um, mini storage or like big box sort of uses in generally in our urban villages. Residential neighborhood, there's one property that's going to have that designation. And this is what we typically apply on our single family. We have one small single family home that's historic, that's actually staying in the village boundary because it was very awkward to remove it. And we didn't want to remove, if there were any developments here, the likelihood of any sort of improvements to line the frontage. So it's left in there, but it's protected. Urban residential is the light brown versus the dark brown. And this is for medium intensity residential uses. So, and it can also support commercial uses. So either can be built. Um, this can provide a gradual transition between lower intensity surrounding neighborhoods to um, this medium intensity sort of housing versus something that's like in downtown. Uh, and the allowable intensities are typically defined by the code, but we have additional provisions in the plan. And lastly, there's transit residential. So this is a high intensity residential designation. It also supports 100% commercial if so inclined. However, if someone wants to build residential, it's at a higher intensity, typically with taller heights. And the density provision is at a minimum of 50 dwelling units per acre. A little bit more about the plan's contents. So the plan contains an urban, villa, uh, urban design and placemaking chapter. And it, this urban design strategy aims to provide guidance on architectural styles that relate to the rich architectural ambiance of the area. It was very important to the community that new buildings uh, integrate well and are reminiscent, but don't, do not copy the existing um, style, architectural styles ensuring that public art is viewable and accessible and making a comfortable public realm. Building on top of that, uh, the community wanted to see gateway elements potentially incorporated into the planning area to help solidify the community identity. So the graphic on this slide has these purple circles and it's many along First Street and then um, two along Taylor. These are nodes where the community would like to see gateway signs placed to announce you are here. They also are interested in having publicly accessible plazas and activity centers, places for folks to congregate. And that is shown, we have a publicly accessible paseo proposed that could be considered if private development comes in, in this green sort of cross here. Uh, we also discourage boxy and modern architecture as it does not relate to the rich existing architectural styles in the village and we have standards around that. We also talk about height. So right now the heights are pretty tall in this village as with most villages. So the minimum height in many parts of this village today under the code requirements is 120 feet. 
and other areas can go up to about 150, if not a little taller. And so to, to actually be cognizant of the compatibility with surrounding neighborhoods, as well as make sure that we reach our growth targets that we are required to reach for housing and job, job growth, we are proposing the height diagram on the right, which was included in the packet. And so in the central area, the community made clear that they would like to see the most intensity. And so that's where most of the 200 feet is proposed. And then in the neighborhoods next to Hyde Park and Vendome, it's down to 50 feet. So it's kind of taller in the center and then goes down from there. So we're also, as part of this, we have to make updates to municipal code section 20.85.020. This was included in the packet. It's our specific height regulations and it controls a lot of the heights that are, uh, the heights that are in our urban villages as well as this area. Um, there are two specific call outs for North First Street and they allow the heights to be a little bit different than what's in the urban village plan. And so what's typical practice is a site, the sites within urban villages get rezoned and we point to the urban village as the point of truth for height, but because there are these additional code sections, we're removing that extra information and making it clear that the urban village plan is where height is um, held and the rule that should be followed. There are section, there's a chapter in the plan about parks and open space. The community wanted to see more places to congregate and to have events. So we're proposing that multi-purpose plaza, um, pedestrian and bicycle paseo. We do encourage community rooftop gardens and community spaces. There is a circulation streetscape chapter. It relies and builds upon uh, the Department of Transportation's existing documents. We don't wanna repeat, replicate existing great information and documents we have that have gone through their own community processes. So the complete streets design guidelines and standards document, we built upon that and this plan supports it. And then our Better Bikeways 2025 document. The Department of Transportation also has the Downtown Transportation Plan, which is moving through its approval process and um, will be approved by city council, I think in this calendar year. And we are also controlling under this urban village plan sidewalk widths. So 15 foot required sidewalks along North First Street, we make sure to include that we also want street tree wells of a certain size to make sure we have healthy street trees. And then on all other streets, we're wanting 12 foot sidewalks with a street tree well as well to make sure that those are healthy. I wanna to touch a little bit about what else is in the packet and as part of this proposal. So we're required uh, under Senate Bill 1333, which was effective in 2019. To, charter cities now have to align our zoning districts with our general plan designations. So there was an effort, it came before the planning commission, there was an alignment of our zoning code to our general plan. And now we're doing the next step, which is this alignment of the, the literal zoning designations to the general plan designations on specific properties. So if a site's zone commercial, uh, but the general plan is industrial, we need to rezone it to be industrial so they're both the same and support the same uses. So as part of the packet, the two zoning numbers, so the two C21s are those rezonings. We've split them into two separate uh, ordinance documents, just like the general plan resos to make it easier to track what's in the village and what's gonna be on the outside. So upon the plan adoption, the urban village would be the guiding policy document for the properties that remain in the village. And all projects would have to comply with the, the rules contained therein. The only exception as mentioned before are certain projects like affordable housing projects that can use like put to perhaps concessions or waivers to get out of um, certain objective standards that are in the plan. And commercial entitlements can continue to move forward but they'll have to comply with all of the rules. So I do wanna read into the record. We received some information two days ago um, about we conducted as part of this work, some historic surveys. And so the third part and final part of this survey was completed just very recently. Um, and so the properties that are circled down on the bottom between Empire and Hensley along First Street in yellow that have the dark brown, so they're fronting on North First Street. 
These two properties were evaluated as part of the Citywide Historic Resources Survey, which was an effort that started in 2017 and is wrapping up, and North First Street was part of that. And the Qualified Historic Consultant evaluated this and determined that those two buildings are candidate city landmark eligible. And as such, um, and they'll be going, and as such, because of that, we want to remove these properties from the village boundary to not give a false sense of the, his, the redevelopment potential. Through the entire process, it was very important to the community and to staff to retain historic resources. And so keeping with that message and to be consistent, we want to shift the boundary up. So we hope that would be part of your recommendation. Uh, the historic preservation officer stated that these uh, properties would be potentially going before the Historic Landmarks Commission for consideration whether or not to move forward with that um, sometime this year, potentially in April. And so I have a long recommendation to read. So the re uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve all of these actions. So considering the determination of consistency with the final program EIR, uh, with the envisioned San Jose 2040 general plan and the supplemental EIR and addenda tier there too, in accordance with CEQA, and adopt two resolutions approving the following. Jennifer, the first. Before, before you go on, Jennifer, mm -hmm. uh, because it is quite long and somewhat redundant since we all have it in front of us. Mm -hmm. Vera, Vera is, she, is, is Jennifer required to read the entire verbiage here? Uh, no she, no, she is no, she is not. But um, what I do want to clarify, though, is that the the candidate historic structures that she was talking about that we were informed of a couple of days ago are um, the addresses are 480 through 490 North First Street. They were not identified. I mean, she looked, you know, it was on the map. So um, any approval, any motion that is made to approve should also include removing those two properties or those, those addresses from the action. Yes, the, and, the the two, and the two in the rear that are urban res, just to make some continuity, but we want to keep their general plan designations as urban res and then change the transit res ones to neighborhood community commercial. Okay, so maybe, so Jennifer, I'll, I'll defer to you. Uh, you don't have to read it's it all. It's up to you. It's a it's a mouthful to read. You do have it in front of you. We do. So uh, well, we'll Jennifer, do... Jennifer, if I may make a suggestion, mm -hmm. um, just tell the commission that you know what what is on the agenda. Tell them which numbers you know need to be changed, and otherwise, Absolutely. you know, and how they how they need to change them. That would be the only thing that I would suggest. Otherwise, you, the recommendation is already on the agenda, and the exactly. commissioners, when they make their motion, can just say you know, um, let's approve the staff recommendation on the agenda and uh, what Jennifer said. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Cool. So we have, these, we have these five properties. There are five total that we're going to be talking about. I'll read you to the record. So we'll do it by APNs because the addresses are a little inconsistent sometimes. So the 480 and 490 North First are the transit res. Staff is recommending that it's removed from the village, which is going to be a change from... Item A, the first resolution, so GP21-016, they're not going to be contained in that document. Instead, they will be added to item B, which is GP21-017, and they will be proposed to be outside the village with a general plan designation of neighborhood community commercial and zoning designations of CP commercial pedestrian. So that's the first piece. The second piece that's different from the packet is these back three properties. They have APNs, so assessor's parcel number of 249430057, same first number is 056, same first number is 055, it's these three. They are going to be removed from item A, which is the GP721-016 added into the G, item number two here, B, excuse me, GP21-017, have, but have the general plan designation of urban residential, which is consistent so that higher medium intensity housing can still be built. And then the last change is 
for these guys. So on the first bullet here, these are for those, we're gonna remove those two transit residential properties that are now NCC, that are gonna be rezoned to CP in, from this ordinance into this, from C21-041 into C21-042. So they're just gonna be moved down. And then the other property is already zoned properly. It's a lot, I know. Yeah, no, no, and Vera, we'll, we'll be coming back to you for a commercial break when it's time to make the motion. So, all right, well then with that, I will go ahead and open the floor for uh, commissioner questions. And, and Jennifer, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I figured we could cut you a break there because it was, <laughs> it's already in our packet. <laughs> Colleagues, do we have any questions from the floor, from the, from the dais? Commissioner Nellis Wise. I um, I I really enjoyed the presentation. This was pretty complex, and you made it really easy to understand. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, I also really liked how you address neighborhood compatibility as a neighborhood concern. I really liked the design standards and how they met. Um, I did want to have a question about the 200 feet height. Like, about how much stories is that? What are we looking at? Do you know? Uh, I. I think, hold on. It's around, let's see. It depends on the ground floor. So it can be around 18 to 25 stories, but it depends on what your floor to floor is as well as your ground floor. And if there's any sort of like ground, any parking podium that kind of offsets that. But I would say around 18-ish stories. And I know a couple other planners are on the call if they want to correct me. Yeah, that would be for residential. For commercial, it would be less because commercial floors are taller. Um, mm -hmm. math, yeah, like maybe 16, maybe 15, I mean, depending. 14 or 15, yeah. Okay. And our ground floor requirement, sorry, and our ground floor requirement is 15 feet. The height. Good. So um, I wanted to know, I mean, you you definitely addressed the community's concern about neighborhood compatibility with historic preservation, um, sidewalk, pedestrian friendly, but how are you all addressing displacement concerns for um, existing small businesses and residents that are long-term in the area? Sure, so unfortunately it falls out of the scope of the work that we do here. Uh, part of the partnership we have with our housing department and with our Office of Economic Development, who are the driving forces behind um, residential displacement and then business displacement, preventing those things. Um, we have to partner with them and the programs that they have in place. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, there are existing programs uh, related to displacement. Um, the housing department or the city has that the housing department led when you're redeveloping and you're displacing people from housing but it's this is like a this is a large citywide issue and so a couple things are going on one there's a, a displacement um program going on and a displacement program are going on for businesses in alum rock and then as part of the five wounds urban village plant updates there's going to be a really intensive sort of st study and then development of a strategy related to business displacement, small business displacement, and, you know, people displacement from their homes. And so I think the thought is at this point, if those would, those, those studies could be the, the sort of um, the framework or, or sort of be used to develop a, a more of a citywide approach. Um, so I think, so, so yeah, so the really approach is more looking at this as a citywide level. The city also does have an anti-displacement strategy that was approved by council. It has a lot of different um, action items in it that are, are moving forward, and that was approved by city council. It's not specific to a growth area or an urban village, but, but throughout the city where displacement is um, either occurring or is anticipated to occur. That's for displacement as it relates to people from their homes, though. And you're working on something with small businesses, some other department is? So the Office of Economic Development 
is looking to, as Michael mentioned, to pilot something. Is it in five wounds or somewhere else, Michael? So they're doing an anti-displacement business program in Alum Rock Park. And then under the five wounds updated planning process, there's going to be additional work done related to this business displacement there that could provide um, you know, strategies that could that potentially could be expanded to be a citywide approach. So right now the approach is focused on specific areas that are either are or are likely to experience displacement with the idea to use lessons learned there to come up with a citywide approach. And I do want to add as well that many of the properties you're seeing, I don't know if you see my cursor with the light with the pink here that are a lot narrower. There's a lot of existing smaller businesses that occupy these historic homes. And so there is a reality that designating them with lower heights and as neighborhood community commercial, they're more likely to be retained in place. And given that they have uh, many of historic designations, they're more likely to be retained in place. Yeah, I, I would just like to see like maybe when, when something gets approved in, the, in this area, um, have some sort of condition of approval that would allow these tenants to, you know, somehow be able to come back. Yeah, so thanks. And you know what I'll do? I apologize, colleagues. I, uh, first of all, uh, Commissioner Kenshawn Young, but before I get to you, uh, Chairman Oversight, I did not open it up for public comment. So what I will do is open it up for public comment and then allow for Commissioners Kenshawn Young after the fact to the public. I apologize. All right, that, was one, that. that was my first question, actually. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> Uh, yeah, do we have any public comment? Yes. Uh, first speaker is Todd. Um, you have two minutes to speak. Would I mute your device? Hello. I attended every workshop and meeting and reviewed the 61 page draft and have several questions still. Uh, number one, it appears that a lot of the village on the west side of First Street has been removed from the plan. I'd like to know why and what is the zoning for these areas, particularly the heights. Um, these are adjacent to residential homes. Number two, I'd like to know if the zoning will mirror the listed building heights. Like there's a 50 foot guideline, will it be 50 foot zoning? I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I've been told the general plan is the city Bible why do some projects like neighborhood business district overlays get different considerations and concessions? Uh, number four, why is the plan growth units and business square feet not adjusted down as the parameters of the project have changed? Number five, why was the police parking lot removed and not included in the density distribution if it's only being utilized for temporary homeless housing. Six, what guidelines are in place to avoid oversaturation of affordable housing projects? Seven, what parking guidelines will be in place? Will there be any additional parking that could be phased out in conjunction with success of the plan? Number eight, can there be any designation of fees or taxes to specifically enhance existing neighborhood parks and the Guadalupe River Park. Nine, any plan lighting improvements, uh, i.e. Uh, historical lighting. And what about the setbacks and the street trees with the SB 35 waivers? And I guess that's all I have time for. I had a few more questions. Thank you. Dan, how much public comment do we have? We have two more hands raised. Okay. Uh, Tim Clausen, go ahead and mute your device. Yeah. Uh, me. Hi. Um, thank you for the time and all the effort that everyone on the staff has put together. Um, I echo my concerns on what happened to the west side um, plots that have been removed out and I quite, I, I'm confused. I just don't understand what happened with that and is currently zoned 120 feet. And that would be the streets from Rankin Air, Hawthorne Way and Clayton. Um, maybe if some clarity could be why those particular um, west side of North First was taken out, that would be great. Another, um, I wanted to know if there is going to be um, an increase 
um, in traffic mitigation, some traffic calming because of the impact of the village on residential area, particularly the shortcuts that are being used to come off Coleman coming from Santa Teresa, Ryland, Street down North San Pedro, crossing Hawthorne, going down Hawthorne Way over into Japantown using Empire. Um, we've got a huge flow of traffic coming through there. What kind of mitigation is in this plan to work to you know calm that traffic for us? And also from Jackson coming across heading west in addition. Also, I'd like to know um, what kind of community um, outreach will we have moving forward? Um, once this is moved on to the council, how many, uh, what's the process and how many um, of, you know, for each new building that would be approved, once this transit village is approved, um, what will be the process in terms of community outreach? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Annalise. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I and many of my neighbors were very happy when we saw the plan that the buildings along First Street at Empire were reduced to 100, from 120 feet to 50 feet near our residential area. And, and now this evening, I heard Jennifer say that it's partially 50 feet and partially 120 feet. So I would like to know more about that. And very much do appreciate that you did listen to our concerns. Um, the other thing that I would like to know is um, about the homes that are in pink purple on the map that are considered more historical um, homes. I'd like to know what that means as that pertains to those homes. And additionally for these buildings, I'd like to know what kind of um, parking construction will be required because um, many of our residential streets in the area are already highly um, congested with with parking. So thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Next speaker we have is Marissa G. Hi, thank you. Um, I think the previous uh, public commenters asked all the questions I had, and I would love to have the answers to those as well. I want to reiterate, I appreciate the taking into consideration the input from the community to lower building heights to 50 feet in some areas near residential areas within First Street. And I also want to say that parking is another top concern that I have, as I know people are heavily reliant on cars in this area and others. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Next, we have Zoom user. If you can please state your first and last name for the record. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Hip Nguyen, and uh, I wanna make my uh, comment very brief. Um, I own property on the uh, North First Street corridor and I appreciate the fact that there's been a lot of community input on behalf of uh, the work by the staff. Uh, I think that the staff have uh, come up with a good plan that appropriately places new high density development near the Civic Center, Japantown, and the uh, St. James light rail stations. Uh, I think this plan will help boost transit ridership and promote pedestrian activity. So I, uh, hope that the commission will approve this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Carlos and Denise Padilla. Hello, Planning Commission. My name is Carlos Padilla, and uh, wanted to first start by thanking all of you uh, commission members for uh, holding this meeting and for listening to public comment. Uh, I own a property on North First Street, and I, I like the urban village plan. Uh, it's similar to and consistent to, uh, with some of the other urban villages that we have already that have been successful, such as the ones on the Alameda and West San Carlos. The First Street uh, 
property uh, area has the additional benefit of having light rail and bus lines. And because of the available transit, it's the perfect location for high density housing and new job growth. I hope the commission will approve the plan uh, as I think it'll improve the area as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have John Thompson. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is John Thompson and thank you, Jennifer, for uh, the, the presentation and the detail. Um, so much appreciated. I'm also uh, a property owner in the, in the downtown urban village area. And I think, I believe that everything that the staff has come up with is, is sensible. It's a great plan. It, I, I like how it's gonna balance housing and job production, which are both important for, for this location. And I just wanted to state, I encourage the planning commission to approve this plan. Um, I, I do believe it's gonna increase investment in the area, which is a, a benefit for, for everybody you know, in this location. So thank you very much. Any more public comment? Sorry about that. I was I'm not muted. Um, we have Nancy. Nancy, go ahead and unmute your device. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, we, we have traffic concerns and my husband will be speaking. Thank you. Hi, Wade Hall. Um, so in the Bendo neighborhood, San Pedro Street parallels First Street and is used as a cut through and all the feeder streets, um, Hobson, Hawthorne, Fox, they're all impacted heavily. So we've been working with DOT for the past 15 years on mitigating traffic. And we've been working against all these odd things like they block highway 87 and then they send everyone down San Pedro. And now Waze is here and Waze sent everyone down San Pedro using the feeder streets. So we need to have an understanding what you, the intention is for managing the traffic, it, it's insanity in the small neighborhood, very small pocket neighborhood. The amount of cars that go through daily is completely insane. And then the parking, we I don't personally have a parking issue. We park on our property, but I look at the streets, there's no parking on the streets. And this new Kelsey project they're putting in is maybe, I don't know, 50 units, 100 units with zero parking, or maybe 18 parking spaces was their intention. So I'm, I'm, I'm leery of the parking uh, intentions you guys have because we're on a transit corridor, everyone thinks there will be no parking issues and there ain't no way that's the case. Maybe in 10 years, we'll have Tesla auto cabs and life will be good, but that's not now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay, Eric, go ahead and unmute your device. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair Bonilla, members of the commission. My name is Eric Shainauer, and uh, I have lived in the neighborhood here for 34 years. And first, I want to thank uh, Tracy and Jennifer and Michael for their extensive community engagement. I attended all of the sessions, both in person and the virtual meetings and uh, uh, I think you get a sense that there's been a lot of input and that the staff has responded to that. Um, as you know, I come before you regularly uh, asking you to support uh, higher density development uh, and higher intensity development in other people's neighborhood. Well, tonight I asking you to please support high density development in my neighborhood. Um, this is the appropriate corridor. Um, I, I looked back at uh, the, the 12 previously approved urban village plans in San Jose, and none of them have fixed rail transit stations, none of them. So this is the first urban village plan that has two light rail stations, Japantown and Civic Center within the urban village area, and the St. James station, uh, a convenient walk 
from the southern end of the urban village. So for those reasons, I hope that you will approve the, the plan tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Mike Sodergren. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, seeing that uh, a substantial portion of the property that was removed from the uh, from the village um, is held by the county, if there's any way that there can be collaboration uh, with the county relative to development on the west side of First Street, um, you know, given the great effort that's have been shown so far in terms of um, compatibilities and step downs and all the rest of it, I'm just curious um, if the um, if staff can comment on that this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes uh, to the list of speakers. All right. Staff, did you want to respond to any of the questions that were presented tonight if you are prepared to answer them? Sure. All right. Let's run down this list. So we will start with, let me share a visual. All right. So this is in your uh, packet. Uh, I'm showing the proposed zoning district. So one of the questions asked was about properties that were removed. So for context here, red line, pink line means in village, blue line means now out of village, but was in the village boundary originally. So we'll go through the properties, we'll scroll down through the maps and talk about the proposed zoning and then the general plan designations and why they were removed. So staff removed this parking, this is a parking lot. Um, it might serve the sheriff station and what, and the, this is the VTA rail yard. And sorry, my cat was just making a lot of noise in the background. Um, I apologize. So this is being removed and actually designated public quasi public because it's part of the entire area where um, Valley Transportation Authority and the county have their master plan area. And they're not intending to use this for something outside of their mission. So instead, we are designating it for the public quasi public use. And as such, the height that will govern here is going to be the if if they develop something that we have any land use authority over, it would be the height in our municipal code, which is 65 feet. However, if a public agency is developing for their mission, they do not fall to us to pull their permits. So we would not have authority over what they are building there. So that's what's happening with that property. Um, the next property in question is here. This is Mission Street. Uh, this is the former city hall site. This is part of this Santa Clara County's uh, civic master plan. We are proposing to align this and designate it public cause a public because it's part of the county's master plan area. And we coordinated actively with the county. They don't want to be part of the urban village plan as they plan to develop this as part of their mission. If that changes in the future, things could always be amended in this plan if they wanted to develop this as a housing project, then they would be under our, and it wasn't for their mission, they would be under our land use authority. But as such, we're proposing public quasi public 65 feet. If they were under our land use regulations, as they're not, it's up to the county what they want to do. There was a question about um, coordination with the county on future development. Uh, we don't have a hand in that. Well, we would be an interested party, and they may put us on maybe a technical advisory committee, the county can develop for their mission. Um, outside of our land use controls. Uh, moving down a little further, this property on Mission and the 87 here, um, we, have lot, we have lot E. So this has come up, this is owned by the city, and the city has decided to build uh, some temporary affordable housing or supportive housing on what we call lot E. And as we coordinated with our Office of Economic Development and they are not planning to do anything that's under our, that where they would need to pull permits from us under our land use authority, like pull a development permit to build a housing project for a market rate 
or as a, as a private developer. So we removed them from the urban village boundary as such. If that changes in the future, the boundary can be adjusted through a general plan amendment. And Michael, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add or if I've covered that sufficiently. You got it. Awesome. Great. We have another property here in green. We are aligning this to um, agriculture. It is uh, being changed to support the open space use that already exists on this site. Garden to Table, if anyone is familiar, operates here. They operate a great local farm. I think they have bees now. It's really cool. Uh, but if you haven't visited, please go. But we are aligning that and removing them from the village as we do not anticipate any sort of growth to be here. It's also a little awkward because there's the the fly up here on this bridge and it's a budding single family and has strange access back here. So we didn't feel that the growth could be accommodated. Down here, you can follow the pink line. These properties that are all in this light yellow and then here in this light orange, they're removed from the boundary. A lot of them, there are some here, like on the corner, there's a small business. Um, these are all existing single family homes. A lot of them are historic particularly on the west side of the village. And so we don't anticipate that there would be any sort of redevelopment and it wouldn't make sense. So we excluded them from the boundary. Similarly, with these properties, they're being designated commercial and this as well, this is single family. We don't anticipate any sort of redevelopment because of historic status. And that's gonna apply to a lot of these properties moving down. A lot of them that are being removed, they just have some sort of historic significance or community and significance. And so we do not want to put them in the village boundary to put a signal to the market that they are um, sites for redevelopment. This is Ryland Park. It was included within the original boundary. It is a developed city park that is used by the community. It is not planned to be torn down and to have other things built on it. So it's been excluded. Here, uh, these properties are existing um, apartments and condos um, that are within the boundary. We have a lot of that in the southern portion of this village, um, mostly south of Hensley that we've excluded from the boundary because they're established newer developments. And by newer, I mean like maybe the 90s, 2000s, they're not really gonna go any place. So including them to accommodate new growth is um, fairly unrealistic in our opinion. And so we've removed them. So I think I've answered that question. Um, and then the heights for all of these properties, that was the last piece, they would be controlled by the municipal code. And so for example, like these properties here between Hawthorne and Clayton, for example, there are gonna be um, commercial pedestrian zoning. So neighborhood community commercial general plan. The height in the municipal code that's allowed is 50 feet. And so if these properties were to be redeveloped, they would have to comply with our municipal code regulations, our general plan regulations. They would also comply with our citywide design standards and guidelines, um, which contain setback requirements. They would have to, and setback requirements and compatibility measures and just general massing and shaping of the buildings to make them interesting and make them compatible. So they would comply with all existing regs that we have. Uh, let's see. I talked about the police parking lot, which is lot E. Uh, so there was a question about oversaturation of affordable housing projects in this village. That is not something that's under the control and purview of the urban village plan. I believe housing, the housing department is working on a, I don't know if saturation policy is the right phrase, but they're looking at how to spread out where they, how the housing department allocates their, um, I believe it's called NOFA. Uh, Michael, what's the acronym stand for? Uh, no, notice of available funding. availability. Yeah, it's their siting plan, mm -hmm. and they're sort of setting uh, criteria, different criteria, including locational criteria for um, projects that would uh, be prioritized for funding. So, right. Yeah. So right. And yeah. go ahead, Michael. Yeah. So they're looking at issues um, of of where to invest in the city, which. Um, as a criteria, which is many cases areas of the city that are of high resource, more affluent areas of the city with um, good access to jobs and schools with high test scores and blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of more where their focus, uh, one of their main focuses in putting housing is in those areas. So that's part of the siting policy that um, I think council's already approved, if I recall. Great, and so as far as 
the, so the housing department has this policy that's gone through, but it's only about city, where city funds are being allocated for what projects based upon having them be dispersed. But this has nothing to do with private affordable housing. If they're not seeking the funding, I don't believe that they are under those provisions. And I do not believe there's anything we can do under our land use controls. I see Vera shaking her head where we can yeah. actually control that. So I just want to make that clear. Yeah, there's nothing actually, within our yeah. toolkit. To control it's illegal that. to deny projects because of some definition that we come up with of over concentrations against the law. We can use right. the power of our purse to encourage projects to go in certain locations, but we cannot deny them. Jennifer, thank Any you, time. thank you, thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, appreciate your 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 feedback to these questions. I'm mm -hmm. going to go ahead now and move it over to to my colleagues. I just saw Commissioner Torrens's hand go up, so we will go uh, Cantrell. Young, Torrens, and then Caballero. Commissioner Cantrell, you've got the floor. Great. Um, I, I really want to say to, to the city staff that first, thank you. You guys do amazing work. Um, I, I think what you do here is help the city move forward. And we all want to see more housing. We all want to see more jobs. But I think good planning should also protect Exist, existing business. And I, I, I know that's not in your purview per se, but until city council finds a way to try to treat existing business equitably, it's hard to approve these things. For me personally, it's just hard to get behind something that may hurt small business unnecessarily. I really respect that the property owners would love to be able to develop their properties. I'd love to see that. But until we learn what equity means and enforce equity for everyone, these things leave people behind, too many people. Uh, I, I think we need to really consider that when we're considering making these large scale changes. So with that, I'll, I'll return it to the floor. Commissioner Cantrell, thank you. We will now go to Commissioner Young. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to echo Commissioner Cantrell's comments. Um, really commend the staff um, on this on this plan. I, I read I read the plan. It's really well written. I found that as I had questions, uh, I would read another page, and my question would be answered. It was, it's just very well done, and I, I think there was a lot of outreach to the community. And I know that's not easy, so I, I commend the staff on that as well, and the and the residents. Um, I do have just a couple of questions. One is, um, so on the original, the original boundary of the village, it appears to me that North Second Street, some properties on the uh, west side of that were included in the village boundary, and and they are not currently. I was just wondering why that change was made. Should I respond now? Yeah, please do. I was just yeah. Where specifically, Commissioner Young? Um, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at page 17, graphic two, and um, unless I'm misreading this, it looks like the properties are on um, or were on uh, North Second Street, um, north of uh, Mission, up to 880. Let me pull this over so we can look at it together. Give me a second. Okay. Sometimes it's just hard. Scroll up. So you said north of Mission. These? R right. The properties on North uh, Second Street, um, even up mm -hmm. around uh, Burton and that area up by 880. Yeah, these are all existing single family homes that are used as single family homes. At many of these properties here, all of these that are excluded are existing single family. And then on the, some of these on the corner, for example, are like historic commercial buildings. Okay. So in an effort to retain our existing, very cohesive um, existing neighborhood fabric, we've excluded them from the boundary. Okay, great. Um, I, did, uh, I did walk this area too. I spent a couple afternoons walking. Um, this whole area was really interesting. Um, the Vendome neighborhood in particular, I, I commend you to go through that neighborhood if you haven't had a chance. There's a lot of really interesting uh, historical buildings and architectural styles there. Um, 
another question I had was in the report, it mentioned the possibility of a future one acre park in the north part of the village. I was wondering if, is there a, a location that that's being considered? So while we, so we cannot designate a private land for a park. So what we do is considered a taking. So instead what we do is we have here a floating peak and so let me expand my view here just a tad. Here is a preferred park location and we work with our parks department. Um, they know that there's a need in the front. So right here, there's like an opportunity potentially. Uh, this was also something that we talked to the residents on second street in particular. Um, there's something similar here on the top, which is like preferred popo, you know, privately owned and maintained, but publicly accessible. But the preferred park location, this is kind of generally where it is, but it's a floating designation. So if and when the parks department gets into negotiations, they may find there's a better location or they um, are able to purchase land somewhere in this vicinity that suits them better. Okay. Nothing's decided is what I mean. Okay, great. Um, and then the... Um... The Paseo uh, that you're showing down on, is that Miller and Asbury? Um, mm -hmm. there, there was some mention in the plan about maybe, um, you know, changing that to more residentially oriented and limiting vehicle traffic there, which I think would be terrific. Could you just talk a little bit more about that area and what kind of the vision for that is? So one of the ideas is that it could potentially be closed down during like events where folks could, um, have community events, maybe have food trucks, but this is something that would have to be worked out if and when the area is redeveloped with the developers and with the Department of Transportation, because we also don't want to create an issue where there's um, unintended consequences and traffic um, buildup. Those streets were also chosen because they wouldn't really impact the transportation network um, in the way that they aren't really dead ends to other, like other streets there's more of a, of a curving sort of undulating um, network down south. Um, and it's really the heart of the village. And so we envisioned this is where more intensity is going. The community wanted to see more of that intensity. And so if there was a real mix of uses with both higher intensity residential and higher intensity commercial, this could be the perfect place to see um, publicly accessible open spaces as well as this paseo. But it's, it's an action item, something that we're envisioning in the plan. And if it comes to fruition, it, that would be great. Okay, great. That concludes my questions. Thank you. Commissioner Young, thank you. Commissioner Torrance. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, uh, Jennifer, wow, and your team. This has been a great presentation. So one of the reasons I wanted to apply to be on the planning commission is because my excitement over the, the urban villages as the, in the 2040 plan. And so for me, this is uh, just uh, so positive seeing these move forward and I wanna help them along. And um, I hear what commissioner Cantrell is saying about concerns with equity. The thing about approving the urban village boundaries and this the, the staff recommendations tonight is that there are no specific plans for for what will go where, that's up to the market. And um, I agree with you that I hope city council continues to develop policies that help protect our small businesses. And so I feel confident that they will and that, um, and that great things are gonna happen. But I would like to um, put my support behind this tonight. And I'd like to make a motion to approve staff recommendation including what I'll call Jennifer's addendum, or we can reference it as something else, but uh, thank you. Thank you. So what I'll do is I am going to allow Commissioner Caballero, and I see Commissioner Cantrell, is your hand back up? It is, okay, perfect, so that's fine, perfect. All right, Commissioner Caballero, then Commissioner Cantrell. Yes, uh, as usual, uh, Commissioner Torrens beat me to the punch as far as making a motion. I live in this district and um, actually I live in this neighborhood that is oriented towards this uh, um, towards this urban village and a uh, transit village plan. Um, I'm really excited about the changes that are being made here. I think that it actually does preserve a lot of the commercial um, opportunities, but in fact, probably increases them because you'd have more, um, uh, just more folks who are accessing. A lot of these businesses on First Street are dependent on um, 
business during the day, right? Because there's not a lot of, even though there's single family on the on the backside uh, along First Street, there many of the properties that are not historic and even some that are are dilapidated, are vacant, um, are not necessarily used to their best. Uh, ability and potential. And so I think that this plan preserves uh, that that which is good about the neighborhood, such as the historic districts and and um, and the while I generally tend towards higher density, I think that this is the right move because so many of these um, single family homes are single story, right? You know, this is a, a primarily single story neighborhood and, and having 18 to 20 stories right behind them would would be difficult, right? So I think um, for the areas where the core, that makes sense, it, it follows in line with what is uh, probably being developed with the county, um, kind of own properties, etc. And I think that this is the right direction for this neighborhood. I think that it'll increase pedestrian um, use. I think it'll hopefully increase transit use along this corridor, um, which is already a higher use corridor, but, you know, maybe becomes more of a destination, not just Japantown, but the rest of this urban village, right? You know, um, I think that uh, we're seeing such beautiful and um, increased diversity and vibrancy within the Japantown neighborhood itself because of some of the um, changes that are finally coming to fruition that were approved by previous planning commissions and city councils. So, you know, I think that this is a great plan. I think that it really took into account uh, both business and uh, residential community members uh, concerns. Um, I do. I don't think that the displacement issues are under the purview of the planning commission. But I echo my commissioners' um, concerns and, and request that you know the city council do something to um, ensure that businesses that are there get the get the opportunity to stay in whatever form or fashion um, happens after development, and they're supported in doing that. So with that, I second um, Commissioner Torrens's motion, and um, I'm excited to see how. Uh, my neighborhood continues to grow and change. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Caballero. Commissioner Cantrell. I, 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 I respect and appreciate your fellow commissioner's opinion. I, I, I really do. I think this is an opportunity for us once again to uh, send something to city council that says, hey, this is something you have to pay attention to. I, I would love to see an amendment to this to allow that says, hey, we'd like to see this included in the pilot. That you're, that you're doing right now uh, in other areas, uh, just to give the, this, uh, this community an opportunity to develop fairly. Uh, so I'd like to, to add a, a friendly addendum, if we can, to say, hey, put this in that, that same pilot, at least telling city council that this is important and it makes planning difficult if we don't. Commissioner Cantrell, for purposes of the, of the friendly amendment, what I'm going to do is give you a second to draft language to propose to Commissioners Torrens and Caballero. And then what okay. I'll do in the interim is I'll call on Commissioner Oliverio. That way we can kind of keep things moving. But it, we get, and then I'll come right back to you and then we'll, we'll, we'll present that friendly amendment formally to Commissioners Torrens and Caballero. Does that sound agreeable? That's fair. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Oliverio. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, one item of interest is that there's probably some commercial businesses that the neighborhood would like to not see would be retained, which are bail bonds. Uh, there, it's not necessarily the most popular use within the neighborhood. And if we're looking at making sure that those can be preserved, I'm not sure the neighborhood would support that. So just sort of keep that in mind, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, people have opinions about different types of businesses, but we're really just about the land use side of the fence. Um, for staff, Barry Swenson Builder approved uh, two buildings at the corner of Mission and Taylor, I'm going to say in the late 90s. They only built one building, which I think is called the Vendome Apartments or something like that. It's approximately eight or nine stories. Are you familiar? I think you're pointing your cursor there. Yeah, I'm fairly certain it's at Taylor and uh, First here. It's That's correct. Taylor and First, my apologies. Mm -hmm. um, so under the new plan, the tower that, or not the tower, but the building that uh, is not yet built, it will now be able to be uh, taller than it's approved today or any idea on that one? So this area is proposed to be 200 feet, which is yeah. likely taller than a planned development zoning, which is on the land today. That would yeah. be 
I doubt yeah. anywhere near that. And the existing uh, Vendome building is nowhere near 200 feet. Okay, yeah. I think definitely. it's somewhere in like the 120 range at the moment. Yeah, so maybe it paid to wait 25 years <laughs> to not build for the extra uh, for the extra units. Um, uh, okay, well, I, I did want to say uh, both this presentation and our cannabis ordinance presentation, I thought both the presenters did excellent in explaining uh, and thoroughly a variety of uh, information in these policies. I think the visual graphics were also above average, and I think that helps not only the commission, but it helps uh, those watching uh, from home. Um, I, I will add, based on what I commented earlier, uh, the staff report refers to the North First Street Local Transit Village Plan. It is not part of the Planning Commission agenda. It's a document on the city's website, and that document as well fails for accessibility. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say, and thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Oliverio. Um, Commissioner Cantrell, are you prepared to offer your friendly amendment to Commissioners Torrens and Caliero? Yes, I am. Uh, right. I would hope that, that um, I'd like to offer a friendly amendment that would add uh, to the um, our approval the um, addition of this community to the current pilot uh, being, being uh, uh, done for equity in, um, I'm sorry, the name of the other community was- um, yeah, Alum Rock. Alum Rock, yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to offer that as a friendly addendum, if you can withdraw your motion and add that. For sure. Torrens, is that agreeable uh, to you? Yeah, I'm agreeable to that. I don't know if I need to say it more, you know, leg legally than that, but hear ye, hear ye, you you approve it. So now I'll ask Commissioner Caballero. <laughs> that, that I think that's fine. Commissioner Caballero, are you okay with that? Can we get staff clarification that the Allen Rock pilot is because of the fact that like development is imminent and actually happening now? And so people are being displaced as we speak versus potential for for like there's no plans to to develop this right now this is just the urban village is that am i correct in understanding that yeah so there's been correct so there's been a number of um uh <clears throat> affordable housing developments proposed and approved in Allen rock uh, there was one by silicon valley sage if you read the mercury data it's under investigation and is being torn apart on uh, the property is being sold but that developer had a couple properties that were going to that were proposed and these either were or are going to result in um, displacement of small mom and pop businesses. And so that's where the real concern about anti-displacement um, arose. Um, you know, we've heard rents have been risen, uh, et cetera. So the other issue is that BART is getting more and more real. And so there's a greater concern that as BART you know, the opening day comes closer and closer, there's going to be even more pressure to displace businesses. And so, so yes, this has been a real thing that has begun to occur and there's been a lot of concern about. It. So that's where this work came out of that work. Um, there are, we're not aware of proposals that would displace businesses on North First Street this time. And I just want to note something that Jennifer brought up that, you know, a lot of the areas where the small businesses are have been essentially, uh, proposed to be designated with a land use designation that would discourage their redevelopment or removed from the village. So that's an approach that we've used in, for example, East Santa Clara to discourage displacement of small businesses. And it's approach, it's one of the effects of the approach that we're proposing here. So I'm not to say that there aren't some small businesses that could be displaced because there's a, a high density designation on, on the property, but for the most part, they were designated for neighborhood community commercial, which discourages displacement of small businesses and read because it discourages redevelopment. Now, it, the, you know, displacement could happen, but it wouldn't likely happen through redevelopment of property. Is that agreeable to you, uh, Commissioner Caballero? Um, sure. I mean, ultimately, it's the city council's decision. I, I, I just don't think it's necessary at this point because uh, displacement isn't imminent. And I do think that the city has um, ongoing fruitful discussions about how to avoid both residential and business displacement. But uh, for the purposes of, of moving the vote forward, why not? Sure. And Commissioner Torrance, I apologize if I cut you off. I 
I don't know if you had a thought that I may have abruptly cut off, but if, sorry. No, did. no, I'm good. Okay. All right, perfect, thank you. Commissioner Cantrell had his hand up and then Commissioner Oliverio, and then I will call for the vote. So Commissioner Cantrell. Actually, my pants just stopped. Go ahead. Uh, okay, Commissioner Oliverio. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, after sitting through hours and hours of discussion about uh, bail bonds in this neighborhood, and the fact that this, what's being proposed on the amendment was never part of the community discussions and all the outreach. I can't support that. And I would ask my colleagues to not support it. Stay with the staff plan. Don't deviate on something that's not in our purview. Understand that where the intent is coming from, but specifically this neighborhood and specifically the, the types of businesses that are there that are not welcomed by the neighborhood today retaining those I think provides a lot of risk and if the community would have the opportunity to talk about this issue they probably wouldn't be happy with the uh the amendment thank you okay thank you for that Commissioner Oliverio colleagues any more comments colleagues going once going twice all right we will now call for the vote uh Bonilla yes Casey yes Caballero yes Cantrell Yes. Garcia? No. Lord Noir? Lord Noir? Yes. Montañez? Yes. Yeah. Oliverio? No. Fernandez Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. Young? Yes. Motion passes with uh, Oliverio and Garcia voting no. We all, we all know what's going to happen when it gets to the council. <laughs> Are we ready to move on, Jen? Yes. All right, so with that, I will now go ahead and close the general plan hearing 2022 Cycle one, do we have a motion? It's so closed. Oliverio, second. second. Lord and all. All right, Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Lord and all. Yes. Montañez? Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Ordenless Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. And Young? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. All right. With that, we will now go ahead to item 11 good and welfare 11 a report from city council staff. Do we have a report from city council? I think we can give uh, Commissioner Oliver the space to give that report. Since we're talking a lot about council member days. The good old days for both of us, right? <laughs> Staff, do we have a report? We, we, yeah, we, we do. Um, so last night was the general plan annual review before city council. It was very late night. If you remember, there were five general plan amendments um, being considered by the council, which you all made a recommendation to the council on for approval of all of them. And um, council did uh, uh, approve all of them consistent with your recommendation. And of course, as you remember, there were two of them that staff had a different recommendation, which was um, the one on Center Road and the one on, oh God, what is it now? <laughs> Forgetting, was it Sharon Drive off of DeAnza? I think it's Sharon or Shannon. So it those, was Sharon. Yeah, Sharon. Those were all uh, approved as recommended by the Planning Commission. And I believe if I can find my notes, but I believe that was it. <laughs> can we, item 11B, subcommittee formation reports and outstanding business. Anything to report there? Um, I don't, I don't know if anybody else has, but I do not. All right, 11C, commission calendar and study sessions. Any study session staff? Nothing to discuss on this item tonight. 
You know, colleagues, I do advise you if there are topics that you want to consider for study sessions, I do recommend that you email staff and perhaps we can we can accommodate that from a scheduling standpoint as well. We're down to the final, what is it, four and a half months of our term. So if there's anything you want to learn about, shoot an email to Michael. Who should we send the emails to? You, Robert, all of the above? Don't they, Jennifer, I think they go to you, right? Jennifer, and you can always CC Robert and I. Okay, perfect. Maybe I'm wrong and Jennifer will clobber me, but I think well, it's to Jennifer. Yeah. Yes, go ahead and send them over to me. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, with that, item 11D, the public record. Do we have anything for the public record, colleagues? All right, seeing none. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Until the next one. Good Thank evening. You. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.